And every time you would go to the other building, like rounds would start skipping across the ground. And you're like, whoa, <laughs> that was like the actual, like real first time that someone shot at me and I shot at them. Nice. Yeah. And so while he's doing that, I'm talking to Jock and he's like, Monsieur, you have saved my life. I'm so grateful. I'm sorry if it's a bad French accent. It's okay. I saved his life. Don't get mad at me. Every single patrol was a combat patrol. That's how I briefed it. That's how it was briefed to me. And uh, that means it's not like if we see the enemy, it's when we see the enemy. Well, uh, Zachary Bell, thanks for uh, coming on to the podcast. That's a pleasure. Um, I might go live later to get some q and A. I I was going to post it. a deal for uh, questions from the audience, mm-hmm. but um, I didn't want to get your title wrong. Oh. So, Marine. Yep. Combat veteran. Yes. Gotcha. Uh-huh. And um, so where do you live now? Now I live in Nashville. Yeah. But I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. Sweet. Yeah. Well, I've been following you for a long time. Veteran with a sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is your handle. Yeah, that's me. And so you got a lot of funny little quips, and uh, you seem like somewhat of a comedian. I try, or at least I I think I am, which is dangerous, I guess. What percentage of your posts on there do you think are comedic? I mean, to me, most of them. Right. Um. Because I'm just trying to, like, find a different way to engage with people. And, and you understand this better than most. You can't just, like, tell people, like, cowboy. You have to, like, tell them why they would love it or fun things about it. Yeah. Like, you can't just tell people to do a thing. They won't do the thing. You got to tell them why they want to do the thing, if that makes sense. Not really. No. <laughs> well, like, <laughs> if you just, like, go cowboy, go cowboy. But, like, you're showing, like, all the different aspects of, like, the life or whatever of, like, you know, doing rodeo and things like that. Right. Trying to relate to them. Yeah. And so, like, that's, I kind of, like, soften out the entry into the, like, veteran military world. Yeah, because some of your posts I don't really understand all that well. I'm working on that. So is that, but are those the ones that are, like, speaking a little more directly to a veteran? Yeah, those are, like, really, like, heavy military talk. Like, if it's a lot of uh, nomenclature or acronyms. Yeah. You know, and it's, like, words that are pronounced a different way that aren't spelled the same way. Uh Uh-huh. And things like that. Like what? Like, one of them is called, like, uh, it's like a, a pogue is what people call them. So, it's like a person other than a grunt. So, it's like a non-combat um, MOS. And so, I was a I was a grunt. I was in the infantry. And so, like, I was a grunt. And they call me a grunt because I was like, Rrr. and I would call them a pogue because they're not a grunt. They're not a grunt. But it's spelled P-O-G, not P-O-G-U-E. And, like, just things like that. Gotcha. And there's, like, uh, all, there's all sorts of, like, acronyms and stuff that are, like, uh, you know, that are only specific to the military. Gotcha. Well, um, so like I, I really wanted to go into the military when I was in high school. Yeah. But it was kind of second to uh, rodeo. Mm-hmm. And me and my buddy, Chris Mills, we were getting ready to like go to the Marines actually. Nice. And um, we were running every day and I just, I just couldn't. You know, I couldn't fathom taking that much time off of rodeo, but he tried to go and he couldn't pass the hearing test. So we gave him the hardest time, you know, <laughs> so he could never go to the Marines. But anyway, yeah. um, so since then, you know, went, went the rodeo route and mm-hmm. called rodeoed and, and just kind of, that's been my lifestyle and now rodeo time podcast is yeah. what I'm on. But, but I've always had that, you know, like lingering, just appreciation for what was going on because, you know, 9-11 had happened recently. And um, long story short, I've since then, you know, watched you guys from afar, Mm -hmm. been a fan, read, you know, probably at this point 15 books over, you know, the war and the 20 years that's, Mm -hmm. you know, transpired. And uh, so I consider myself, I've read enough books, I'm pretty much – like a Navy SEAL, Marine Recon, Delta, Green Beret, Opera, you know. You yeah. Know, I, I, I'm pretty much there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, welcome to the fold. So, yeah. I, I took a, an ice bath this morning, so that's the Navy SEAL. Check that off. I, uh, I've i trained with Tim Kennedy, so I'm a Green Beret now. Yeah. You know, he made me throw up in a workout. Did he really? So, so I feel like we have a lot to, you know, you and I, it's like, 
A lot of these listeners may not know what we're talking about. You know. Yeah, I mean, hang on, guys. We'll try to keep you going. I mean, you know, it's a lot of uh, a lot of good. You know, and so if like I ask says, questions, yeah. if I ask questions for you to explain, it's not because I don't understand. It's just because you know I want our listeners. Yeah. So no, I I, I get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I get, I get. Right. It. Yeah, yeah. Don't um, worry. No. So tell me about your tell me about your story and what um, I guess attracted you to the military. I mean, um, I've thought about this for a while, but like the the main thing is just nine eleven. It just it sticks. I mean, I, I I always wanted to join the military, but if there's like a moment where I was like, this is something I need to do. Yeah, I just felt that that happened. I mean, I was in eighth grade when nine eleven happened. Dang. Um, my mother called. You know, and we're on Central Time, so it was Eastern, and. Uh, you know, the events happened, and then so we hadn't gone to school yet is what I mean. And uh, she's like, just stay home. Just stay home. And I was like, okay, because we were supposed to walk to the bus. And me and my brother, you were, me and my so little. You would have been on which, the West Coast? No, I was in Central Time, but, like, we hadn't gone to school yet, so it was, like, 7 o'clock or whatever. We were, like, walking to the bus stop. But it all the events had already started happening. Gotcha. And, um... My brother and I were just like, okay, we're just like staying home. And I turned on the TV and I, I was like, whoa. And I saw one of the towers with smoke coming out of it. And then I saw the second plane make impact. And I was just like, this is gnarly. And I, like the rest of the world, just was glued to a television for the next, you know, day, day and a half longer. Right. You know, and then it, that left a, a big mark in me of uh, wanting to like understand that and to like, uh, protect my country and all these different things. And at that time, there's also so many other things that were happening too. Like, um, my cousin ended up joining the Marines, uh, about, he's about four years older than me. So he joined and he was in, uh, Iraq and the push in Fallujah and then did another deployment after that. And, uh, he had this, like, he had this air about him of like, um, confidence and like swagger. I remember like I saw him and he was, he was like my older brother in a lot of ways. Um, and he was just like showing me stuff like how to, you know, be a man and different things like that. Cause either one of us had our fathers in our lives during that time, you know, cause we were, both of our parents were divorced. And, uh, so I, he would like teach me stuff like older brother stuff and be like, Oh, this is how you do that. This is how you do this. And, um, I remember when he went off and he joined, I saw him at boot camp, and I was like, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Like, like he was, it was um, jarring how different he was. Not in a negative way. Like, yeah. just him, just like, it was, because he had just, like, upgraded. Like, he had, like, swagger about him, confidence. What's his name? His name's Mitch Cannon. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, he lives in Tupelo, and uh, he's, uh, I love him to death, actually. And so, like, he did that, and so. Um, how much older than you? About four he? years, yeah. I believe, yeah, roughly. Um, because... So that had happened, and, you know, I was kind of piddling around Memphis at that time. I wasn't really, like, into school. School wasn't really into me either. I was somewhat of a troubled youth. Uh, I was just kind of angsty. Just good time pranks, you know? Nothing too crazy. Nothing that I can admit here. Like, uh, I don't know, we would, like, take shopping carts at Walmart and, like, launch them into the, the little thing or whatever. It was, it was just, like, kids being kids. Um Nothing like what people do now, like YouTube pranksters, like running to people, like screaming at them and stuff, being like, oh. it was just like us goofing with each other. Right. And, um, you know, I, uh, I had, uh, did a, you know, a semester at the University of Memphis and that didn't really pan out. I just like wasn't involved. And I started talking to a recruiter in like August or September of 06. And my girlfriend at the time, who became my wife, um, she was like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I really want to join the Marines or military. Like, I really, really want to do it. And my cousin at that time, he had, like, picked up sergeant. He had, like, a stack of ribbons, and he just looked like, he looked like a man, dude. Like, when he had his uniform on, I was like, dude, Mitch looks jacked. <laughs> like, he was just, like, in his, like, peak at that time. And um, he had, like, progressed through the ranks very quickly and done a lot of cool stuff. And I was like, oh, dude, I really want to do that. Like, I really, really want to do that. But, um... I'm sorry, this is a long story. No, that's all right. It's but, fine. We're uh, here. My, um, so my wife's cousin was a really good friend. He is a good friend of mine. His name's Luke. And so Luke and I um, have been friends for a long time. And his cousin, 
my wife that lived in Nashville, he'd never told me about it forever. But he had joined the army, and the army at that time was cutting checks to people. Like it was, it was gnarly. Like thirty grand for an enlistment at that time. They're like, "Can you breathe?" And they're like, "All right, you're in. Just do, just get in there. Give him a gun. Keep going." And um, he was uh, going to Iraq, and so I'm still talking to the recruiters, but I'm you know I'm not like sure what I'm doing. And uh, his family had asked me if I would go pick him up from the airport because they were going to do a surprise party for his father who was in um, the army. And it was like his 50th birthday, and this big thing was going to happen. Big surprise party. And so I was like, cool, I'll, I'll go pick up Luke. And um, I went to go pick him up at the airport. And again, I saw like this this guy I'd known forever. It was just like there was something different about him. I, I, I don't know what it is, but I think it's just because Initially, when you're there, you're scared or whatever in boot camp and stuff, but you kind of go through this, these like trials and tribulations, and it kind of forces you, it forces change, kind of like, um, I don't know, resistance training. Like it's just mm-hmm. like you become something different no matter what you do, even if you yeah. don't want to. And, um, you know, uh, I went and picked him up, dropped him off at the place, and everyone was like super surprised, and it was like a really cool moment. And then I looked across the room, and I looked, there was this gorgeous, gorgeous girl. And I went up to Luke, and um, Luke, uh, I, I, I was surprised there was a very gorgeous girl in Luke's house, is what I'll say. Like, cause yeah. I was a guy, I'd be like, hey, you want to, like, hang out? And I had, like, lots of friends and stuff. And I'd, I honestly went to different schools every year, except for my sophomore year. Like, every year I switched schools. So I had, like, friends all over Memphis, and like I said, I was kind of angsty. And, um, yeah. So I was like, man, who is that girl? And he goes, oh, it's my cousin, Christy. And I go, that's that's your cousin? He goes, you never told me about your cousin, dude. And he goes, yeah, she lives in Nashville. And I go, dude, why have we never talked about your cousin, Christy? What What is this? And he goes, right. he goes bro, you weren't ready. And I go, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> I go, that's fair. I go, tell you what, though, I'm going to marry that girl. And he goes, all right. And then like two weeks later, we were dating. Dang. And, and then um, not long after that, you know, I ended up, uh, we dated and then we, and proposed and got married but while we were dating she was like if you really want to join the marines or join the military you should really look into it because i think you can do it and i was like yeah i think i can do it and, and then like i just seen so many different people and they had this change on them just like i don't know it's it's really hard to describe now but like there's just something different i think it's because they had pushed through adversity and come out the other side and they had something they'd never had before mm. and so i did that and then I was like, all right, I'm going to enlist. And so in January, I enlisted. And January of 07. Uh, January of 07, I enlisted, and I left for boot camp in February, February 12th, 2007. Gotcha. Yeah. So yeah. what? when did you graduate high school? Um, 2006, May. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah. Right, it's a me. long story. <laughs> no, that's all right. I'm curious of it. And uh, so 07, you got out of boot camp, and then how long was it before you deployed? Um. About a year, and I was uh, I was actually at that time I think I, I got in at like one ten. I was weighing one ten. Dang, yeah, bro, it was it was gnarly. Wow, yeah. And so they put me on double rations in boot camp, which isn't as cool as it sounds because notoriously everyone else isn't like fed enough. But every meal I would drink two glasses of milk, and like eat like these big peanut butter packets, and then I'd get like two of each food item. Yeah. So what? When I came out three months later, I, w- I was 130, 140. Like, wow. I just packed it on. Did you, like, did you feel a big, I oh, mean, bro, it 30 was, pounds of muscle? <laughs> Dude, it was great. It was, it, I was like, I was yeah. doing pull ups, like, because in the Marine Corps at that time, the pull up fitness, the fitness test was uh, 20 pull ups, um, 100 sit ups, and a three mile run, and 18 minutes on three mile run. But if you could do 20 pull ups, that was the thing that mattered. Like, running's cool, but like 20 pull ups was the thing. And so yeah. I was like, okay, I'll get 20. I'll get yeah. 20. And so that, that was like my goal, just getting 20 pulls right. every time. And so so the 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 18 minute three mile, that wasn't well, it's so it's it's like any other thing. It's like a game of like numbers. So if you like do like you're gonna get a hundred sit-ups, right? But if you're like looking at the test, you're like, okay, what can I do to increase my chances of I getting the you. most points? Because if you, you get 285, so each 100, 100, and 100 is the total points for 300. But if you get 285 or higher you get the same points as if you got 300 so it's like okay i'll just get 20 pull-ups and if i'm not feeling the run it's cold whatever things aren't happening 
I was, I'll be good. I'll come in with the first class. Gotcha. Team. So running just not my thing. Yeah. I want it to be, which is what I'm trying to do this year is like run more than ever, but you bet, you know, I'm trying to get better. It's just not my strength. So you come out of there, you're 130, 140. Yeah. I put, yeah, I put on easily 20, 30 pounds of muscle. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. It was, it was wild. Cause boot camp is what? Six weeks? Um, three months. 90 days. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. It was, it was fun. It was at Paris Island, which is really weird because it's, it's, it's a small island. They used it at one right. time during World War II to have planes and stuff on it. And, you know, it's very historic. Right. Um, but yeah, it was, it's all exactly like what they say. Yeah. It is. Um, so then what? You go to, you go to job school. Job after school. That. Yeah. It's uh, called, at that time, I went to the School of Infantry. Right. Um, and so that was another few months. I can't remember how long. Yeah. Exactly now, but they just like teach you like the job you pick. And so when you're in the infantry, you pick like either riflemen, machine gunner, mortarmen, assaultmen. Some places do tow gunners, but those are the main jobs. And like you just sign up for a field and they come out in a big presentation. They're like, hey, do you want to shoot mortars and rockets, whatever? Be a mortarman. All right. You want to like blow stuff up and shoot rockets? Be an assaultman. You want to shoot machine guns? Be a machine gunner. And then this one guy came out. And each of the instructors gave their little pitch. This one guy came out, and he had a big old dip in. And he's like, you want to be in charge of these idiots? Be an 0311. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'll do that. And so that was basically it. Gotcha. Yeah. So what does that mean, 0311? It's infantry rifleman. Okay. So it means um, infantry rifleman. Every one of those are, like, supporting assets um, associated with uh, the infantry. So, like, machine gunners are used to, like, you know, help provide suppressing fire as an infantry rifleman maneuvers across a, you know, a space. Um, same thing with like, you know, the mortarmen. They close up the dead space of a battlefield, like basically, so like restrict enemy movement to like channel them in a certain way again to support the things of an infantry. So, um, how long were you at job school? I want to say it's not three months, maybe like two months or something like that. You don't. You feel like you're learning a lot. It, it's a lot, but like you're, it's really, you're, you're learning stuff doctrinally. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It would kind of be like if you, uh, I mean, some cowboy terms I picked up kind of like if you just sat on the spur board, is that what it's called? Yep. And never got on a horse. Gotcha. Did I nail it? Yep. Yeah. In rodeo. That's a ro yeah. yeah, a rodeo term. We got yeah. spur boards back there in, yeah. the, in the gym. Yeah. So, so, uh, that's two months. Yeah. So that's. We're down to five. Yeah, what yeah. did you do for the other seven before you deployed? You just do a pre-deployment, a workup. And so that's that's where you learn. That's like where things, where the rubber meets the road. Yeah. And it is gnarly getting dropped off the first time. Like it's it's pretty cool, actually. In pre-deployment? Yeah, so you get you could then get sent to your unit. Like what happens is like you graduate, and it's not a real graduation. It's just like, all right, blah, 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 and they give you a little thing. And then buses start showing up, and they pick you, and they send you to whatever unit you're going to, East Coast, West Coast, or Hawaii. Yeah. And um, where'd you go? I went to a 1-6 Alpha Company. Which is where? It was just in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And so this bus showed up. A guy went on to become my platoon sergeant was there. You get on the bus, and then you, like, you go to a place called, uh, the Army calls it CIF, the Marines call it SIF. <laughs> like a, it's a big deal apparently because I said this once like on a video and people are like who says SIF and like that's just what Marines call it but they call it CIF so it's like where you get like all your gear issued and like you check in and the whole time you're being herded like cattle there's like I don't know over 30 of us and then we go to this like big room and they're like Alpha Company Bravo Company Charlie Company Alpha Company like they're literally just like drafting you like that they're like looking at you and like you know I don't know I guess the way you like look at cattle or something Right. He's like, yeah, come here. Like, one guy, like, touched me, and he's like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to be a rifleman. He goes, all right, Alpha Company. Like, and all my friends actually went to a different company except for me and, like, two people. Yeah. And uh, I was bummed about that. But then you get dropped off at a barracks, which is, like, the big brick buildings. They're, um, like, made to withstand, like, any kind of attack. And there's catwalks, and um, <laughs> you get dropped off in a quad area. So it's, like they make a square and it's just this open field where there's these wash racks to wash your gear. And then there's all these Marines that just got back from like their third combat deployment in a row, yelling at you, cat calling you, throwing stuff at you as you're like walking through, dragging your gear. And the first few weeks are pretty rough. 
Yeah. I don't want to say the word hazing. It wasn't that bad, but it was it was intense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. A lot of bonding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's silly some of the stuff they would do. It was never a lot of it's to teach you stuff, but like some of it was just kind of funny. Were any of those guys chill? Like, hey, don't worry. Yeah, there's a few of them. There's a few of them. Guys who are like getting out. Short timers, what they call them. Like they're at the end of their enlistments. They got like a few months left. They're cool, but like it and initially the like first week is just chaotic. Short timer being somebody that was just did their four years yeah. or just anybody that's about to get out. Well, in, in that context, it's just used it's just used as someone who's getting ready to leave. Like they, they don't have much time left. So what happens is if you have like it doesn't come down to four years exactly. So there's like, you know, six months to a year on average and they don't have a job in a platoon. They don't have anything to do. They're just kind of like, oh, they're just waiting to leave the military. Uh-huh. So they just have to show up once a day, check in in the morning, be like, I'm here, and then they go away, and then they come back at the end of the day, and then they do that until their time's up. Gotcha. But it was it was intense, you know, like, you know, log PT, um, you know, doing uh, remedial training, extra military instruction, as they call it, for different things. Um, you know, I, I thought it was funny, most of it. But right. It was, you know, it was fine. Um. So you're there for six months? Yeah, just, you know, just learning um, the trade. At that that point, you're, like, learning. You're doing drills every day. Yeah. Every aspect. Like, it's legitimate on-the-job training. Like, you'll be doing something, and then they'll ask you, like, a question. Like, what is, you know, team wedge, squad column, you know, make it now. And that's a patrol formation. And so then you just, like, you're walking, and then you just make that. All right, enemy in the open, and then you practice. I'm up, they see me, I'm down. And so you're doing bounding, you know. Yeah. Stuff and like all these things you're just doing. It's crazy to think about it now that I was just doing that, but like it's kind of like uh what's his name? Mr. Miyagi, where he's uh-huh. teaching him how to clean. Like, and you're like, what am I doing? I'm just like, but like that is this the same things that you'll recreate in combat. It just feels silly at the time. Right. But you're it's being drilled into you muscle memory just like just like anything else. Like any type of high stress job, any type of thing where there's like an adrenaline rush, like and you'll know this too is you know, rodeo, like when everything is like turned all the way up, you have to go back to that muscle memory of like, this is what we do. We've been you here. Be- we've been here before. We have to just like ride this out. Yeah. That's what the spur board's for. Yeah. 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 I, I, yeah. I was giving Rowdy some tips on the spur board. Yeah. Well, that you, you just, <laughs> if you've, if you've driven those fundamentals into your foundation and core and soul, you know, then all you need to do is focus on controlling your emotions. Mm hmm. Yeah, because you, you start to develop like a belief in yourself that I don't feel you get otherwise. Right. And so it was just a lot of stuff like that. You know, you'd be asked questions while you're doing things. You know, what does this mean? What does that mean? You know, plotting points on, you know, a map and different things. And so we're just training the whole time. Mm-hmm. And you go out to the field sometimes for a week or two, come back, go out for 30 days, come back and all those things. And so by that time, uh, my wife and I had gotten married and, um, they told us, they're like, hey, you're going to the Mediterranean and you're going to be on a boat. And I was like, oh, no, please, please don't do that to me. Because yeah. in the infantry, especially at that time, if you were being told you weren't going to war, it's like a death sentence. It means you'll be a boot forever, which is like a curse. Yeah. Like, that means you never, you are, you're always doing like the worst job. You're like, yeah, like every day, every morning we would wake up at like four, get there by 435, get in formation. Well, but before we get in formation, you have police call. That's what it's called, where you, like, walk out in front of the barracks, pick up all the trash. Doesn't matter if you live there or not. Pick up all the trash, put it away, clean the whole area, get in formation, go PT, and then, like, carry on your day. But everything is, like, give me a working party. It's just a – you're a boot, and it's all based off of uh, – it's a meritocracy. That's that's what's cool about the military. At, at its core, it's, like, if you're good, you will succeed. Mm-hmm. If you're not, you will not. <laughs> so, yeah. So – uh, is that what happened? No, we did. Um, we um, did some time. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we we like did training most of the deployment as if we were going to the Mediterranean. Like it's just called like so. Th- the Marine Corps especially does a lot of peacekeeping missions. They're called MUSE, Marine Expeditionary Units. And so th- what they mainly do is they provide like presence and security and um, disaster relief um, all across all across the globe. And so in particular, like that mission was going to be in the Mediterranean. So we would respond and have a presence there in case of anything happening and just like 
kind of just like working with partner countries, doing training, stuff like that. It's just really good, like peacekeeping, like ally building stuff. And um, I even did a month on a ship, which if you're a Marine on the ship is the worst. Yeah. You have no job. They don't like you. And like you're in a coffin rack, which is so small that when I was reading a book on my stomach, I had to turn it down to turn the page. Wow. Like, I was just like this. And I was like, yeah. you know what book it was? Uh, yeah, you, if you guess what book it was, it's a, you've, I'll give you a hint. The old man in the sea. No, it's not. Uh, I'll give you a hint. Never quit. Oh, there you go. Marcus Luttrell had yeah. already come out by then. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Cause that happened in 05. Yeah. Um, and so it's funny. I had, I was reading that book and then I think about all my life to put me to a place where I've met him. He calls and gives me the craziest calls ever, which are so motivating. Yeah. And then like, he's a friend of both of ours and like, we're right, right here. What an amazing Yeah, life. it's wild. The internet's wild, isn't it's, it? I, I can barely, I'm so scared that like I'll close my eyes and wake up like in a meeting, like somewhere. Being Every like, day. And like, well, you know, according to projections, you know. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. Every day. Yeah, I was reading like, he's like, I'm a Navy SEAL. And I, was just, I just remember tilting my book down being like, oh, it's not that big of a book. <laughs> like, right. Um, But we had gotten married and they had said we were going to have um all this time. So me and my wife, we started planning our our wedding and um we we had gotten married but we, we were still playing a ceremony because gotcha. she couldn't move there i didn't i wouldn't get the money i wouldn't be able to move out of the barracks and stuff they give you until you're married and so you know by miracle we found out that she uh we had conceived our first child mm. and i was like okay cool so we'll move the ceremony date and then they're like oh yeah by the way you're not going to the mediterranean you're going to afghanistan was, oh snaps Ah, oh, that's not, that's not good. So, why was that not good? Well, I mean, it's it it was everything was like going perfect until that point. I wanted to go for my job, but when I found out she was pregnant, everything had just kind of changed. So, just the fact that you were going to be away from your kid is what yeah. made it not good. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, and so we found out in February of two thousand eight, and so we went home on pre deployment leave. They had told us like late January we left on pre deployment leave. Late February. Um, going into March and early March, um, my wife, Christy had gone into labor. And so I was supposed to be back and I called my platoon sergeant. I was like, Hey, I, she's in labor. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to make it. And I was terrified. Yeah. He was a, he was a very animated platoon sergeant is all I'll say. Um, and he was like, at that time he was, uh, you're still a boots. So you were kind of still beneath everyone. So they're very like blah 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 blah, but he was like, "That's okay, we'll you'll be so fine." You're about to deploy. They were. I was supposed to be back home. I was supposed to be back home. Uh, not back home. So we were on pre-deployment leave. She goes into labor, and then the day I was supposed to is the day I was supposed to go back to North Carolina. So not I, necessarily leave, but just be back there. Yeah. Well, they were leaving the next that like next week. Okay. And so I was technically a wall because because okay. they were like, "Ah, oh, you weren't here." And, um, but I called them, they knew, so that like kept me out of trouble. And, uh, they're like, all right, Alpha Company is going to leave. You're going to leave like two weeks later with Charlie Company. Cool. And then my daughter was born early March 2008, my first daughter. Dang. And then, like, it was the first time I was like ever really scared. Yeah. You know, little, just like on my chest, you know, spending that time together, seeing her there. Yeah. Everything, the world becomes so small. How'd your wife feel you going AWOL for? Her? She's proud. Yeah. I mean, like, she knew the, like, severity of, like, they could be, like, you have to be here. You're in trouble. Right. There's, like, things that you that don't, can happen. Don't get pulled over because they'll arrest you. Yeah. But I was, you know, if I'm going to get in trouble, it's fine. Yeah. I'll, I'll it, take that. It was worth it for you. That way I can tell my daughter, like, when she's mean, you're like, you know, I got thrown in the brig for you, <laughs> you know? Yeah. That was uh, one of the, that's, uh, it reminds me of one of the, there's a quote I read somewhere but it says, do the right thing for the right reasons and live with the consequences, which to me means that like sometimes when you do the right thing, consequences sometimes have a negative connotation. So like you needed to do the right thing to be there for your family, even though the consequences meant possibly like you getting in severe trouble. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't uncommon at that time. And it's still not for people just to leave and not show up. I mean, there were people who didn't show up. There's things like that that happened. And I, I get it. But like I was, oh, oh well, I'll live with the consequences. It was worth it. What was it like stepping, getting into Afghanistan two weeks after your platoon? Um, 
the only good side was I landed in a place called Kandahar Airfield, mm -hmm. which was awesome. <laughs> like, yeah. um, it's a very famous place in Afghanistan. Uh, it's not there anymore, uh, but they had this thing called the Boardwalk that um, had a Tim Hortons, a TGI mm -hmm. Fridays, and a Burger King. And so my first meal in Afghanistan was at Burger King. And, like, I just landed there on this airstrip. It's Kandahar Airfield. That's what's called CAF. And so my unit had been there, like, all together about, like, a week or two ahead of me. But they were still planning the mission. You have to acclimatize and all these things. And so they were they were fine. Um, but you didn't miss anything? I didn't miss anything because nothing had happened. And then I was like, why did I rush? Like, I could have, like, you are just here. And so, um, cause it's the way it works at that time with the Marine Corps especially is you would land in these really big bases and then you would push out for seven months. So you hit the ground thinking like they're going to be running everywhere <laughs> yeah. and like yeah. stuff's going to be, yeah. and they were just chilling in Burger King. Like, Oh, what's up Zach? This is literally what happened. Yeah. They're like, Oh, we, you know, we bought some DVDs. You want to watch like Iron Man? Because all the locals would sell these bootleg copies of movies and stuff. Yeah. I thought it was going to be like rounds coming in like, God, you know, like mayday, mayday. Right. Right. Welcome brother. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> but instead it was like, dude, let's go get some Burger King. You're in the thick of it now. I, yeah. And it couldn't have been any farther removed from that. Right. Of course, that's that's where the generals were. That's that's like where yeah. NATO was. Like that's it was a huge base. Planes would come in twenty four seven. Like uh, Toby Keith even came. I have a really cool Toby Keith story. Actually, he came Sweet. there for the USO. Um, he um, you remember the Taliban song? Yeah, vaguely. Yeah. Where uh, like he says, where he says, we'll put a boot in their ass. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah so he comes there with the USO tour. Everyone's like, let's go see Toby Keith and. <laughs> You know, it was a different part of the base. They literally had, like, the main base and the Marines were over in a different spot that they ended up turning into, like, their, like, waste collection site, which is pretty funny. Like, it's where they would put all the trash in the burn pits. But it, they hadn't done it yet. So we would, like, get on a bus, a bus that one Marine would drive, and their vehicles are backwards in the sense of, like, the stick shifts here. You know how we're, like, first, second, third, fourth, fifth? Right. It's reverse. Whoops. Yeah. Oh. No, it's all, no, it's all right. It's still rolling. Okay. Um, I think it's good, but it's first, second, third, fourth, fifth, like fifth is closest Dang. to you. Wow. And I only know this cause I got tasked with driving it once. Yeah. And so I was like, <laughs> like it, it right. messed me up. But, um, we go there and it's, he's playing and like, so a thing that would happen to this base is called IDF, which is indirect fire. And so the Taliban at that time would just take like rockets or mortars and a mortar is just a round in a tube with a nail on the bottom of it. And so they would, they had a time release method, which is they would take ice and shove it down the mortar tube and then just like set it up and leave and then come back in a little while or not come back in a little while. And then it would launch. Yeah. And so instead of like having batteries and stuff like that, it's just ice is like easier for them. And whenever those would launch, these like air raid sirens would go off because it, they measure seismic activity and like all these different, things like around the base and so they would know when like these things were happening and uh, it would happen every now and then you get in a bunker it's fine you know people right. are like, oh, you know boop, boop. And it's just like really loud and you just like go well toby Keith's out there and he's he do, he's he's burning it down this is you know courtesy of the red white and blue toby keith he right. couldn't have been bigger larger than life he's like brought to you Kurt. just yeah 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 he's just playing his heart out dude just laying it down hard and then right as he's like, he starts to he starts to sing the Taliban song, like air raid sirens start going off. It's <laughs> boop, boop. And they, they kind of do it pretty much clockwork. But they're like out there and like an Air Force guy, like a public affairs officer, like comes out there because like they don't want Toby Keith to get blown up. Like, you know, right. they're like trying to cover him up and they push him back, whatever. And then like all of us are like, boo, <laughs> like yeah, we're booing. Yeah, yeah. Like, don't go, dude, don't go. And uh, under duress, he then like came back out and finished a Taliban song. Oh, while, that's awesome! While they were um, attacking us, which is pretty cool. Man's a patriot. He's a patriot. That man's a patriot. Yeah. Uh -huh. So the and like that was it. Like we were just there. We would work. We would like work out every day, train every day. Elevation so much higher there. You get used to the heat. You used to all the different things that you're going to experience there. And um, then we launched on the mission to Garms or Afghanistan. How and, long after you'd landed was? Where did you take off to like, on a mission? I think it was like two and a half weeks, something like that. Oh, that's not bad. It's it's not bad, but like it's it's a lot. Like the days are yeah. long. And uh, another thing that happened was we had a reorganization of our our whole battalion, which is four companies. 
So I was in a platoon, and then I got moved to a different platoon. And people I, I didn't know as well. Y'all know each other, but not as well. And there was just, uh, it was it was a big change, but, like, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me in my career. So what, um, what was your first mission like? Uh, we just um, get out on a helo, and we insert in the middle of nowhere and just, just start going after it. Yeah. Just start going after it. I actually ended up. Uh, falling falling down into a really deep hole, and I I got pulled out, but for a day. But then I got sent back, so it worked out. But uh, yeah, it was pretty gnarly. Like we were like moving and taking fire, and like ended up falling down a. It's called a Wadi Canal. It's their waterway system, and I did, and I got I got my bell rung hard. Like I had a bunch of ammo on me too that like knocked me down, and it was like in a sling, mm-hmm. and just like my. <laughs> You know, just trying to move, and the ground there's so soft, and I just melted like butter and just fell down the hole. Came back, and okay, um, looked at. They were like, oh, he's good. He's going to push back out, and uh, I pushed back out with the, the rest of the platoon, and we just started at that time what was, um, like we would land in the town and then like push out to like the edge of the city, and then we would set up positions and then begin security patrols. And so you wouldn't really see much like in the initial – assault phase right because the the enemy doesn't know what you're doing you don't know where they are you don't know anything about the battle space you have no real situational awareness no orientation and then you're waiting but you know as as soon as we would stop moving they would just start lighting us up yeah it it was it was pretty rough it was pretty rough there for a while but like uh we set up a position and we had like two different buildings and every time you would go to the other building like rounds would start skipping across the ground you're like whoa (laughs) like you just right it's like, what are we doing? And then you start shooting back, and then like it just starts happening. And um, what was your first moment of this is real? Uh, this is real. I'm thinking of a, everything else hadn't really, you know, Toby Keith, the air raid sirens, all those things had been like okay. It still felt fun, but like um, my first fire, the first time I like remember like actively engaging a guy is me and my friend. Chicky Chop, we were like um, behind a wall, and uh, my my squad leader Ryan told me he's like, if you hear a crack, that's good. If you hear a whiz, that's bad. He's like, crack is here, crack is here, whiz is here. And I was like, okay, <laughs> and sounds like you have no point of reference. And he had been, you know, on multiple deployments at that point, and uh, we're like looking at this guy, and like you see stuff, you see this dude, and I see his like blue door, and I was like, what is this? What's this happening? This guy like pokes his head out. And like, okay, what are you doing? And then like he pokes his head out and he starts shooting at us. And I remember I was like, crack is bad. Whiz is worse. And I felt the the dust like of, of it hitting the wall behind me. And I was like, oh my God. And he's like, shoot back, idiots. And I was just like, okay, oh yeah. <laughs> like, cause like you have no you have no contacts until that point. And so we did, and that was that was like the actual like real first time that someone shot at me and I shot at them. Nice. Yeah. Um so how long was your first deployment? It's seven months of just yeah. that. I mean, at, at that time, it got easier um, as time went on. I mean, there were a few, like, touch-and-go moments. I was behind a wall when an RPG hit it. We didn't know how bad that would be. That was, like, and that was right after I just got my knocked out, like, a week before. So it was, like, my second concussion in, like, a week. Right. And that was pretty gnarly. But we ended up holding that position for 24 hours. And then eventually the town just kind of settled. Like, uh-huh. they just kind of went about their business. We went about ours. And uh, it was what I would call, like, a really good first deployment because with a Mew, you have all these assets of, like, artillery and air. And those are always there, but those are, like, regionally supporting multiple different units, different brand, the Army, Marine Corps, any of it, throughout that an entire battle space. But these were attached directly to us. So, like, something happened, we called in air. We called in artillery or whatever. You sat there for 24 hours? Uh, at one place, yeah, we would hold places, um, but like against a wall that had just been hit by an RPG. Uh-huh. Like it's just like, yeah. were you just kind of stranded, or was just like, no, we're here, we could leave. When so we, want. we were rearranging the battles. I'll tell the story better. I'm so sorry. Uh, oh, that's all right. It so, just sounds interesting. So when you when we pushed out to the assault, the company commander then looked at our area of operations called the AO, and he decided where to move each platoon based upon whatever ideas he had, and so he moved our platoon from one part of the battle space to another. And um, while we were doing that, we had to hold this position 
for 24 hours. And we got there. The platoon that was there was like, hey, you look across that field, you see that door. That's a bad door. Don't go there. Like they're trying to, they were trying to bait us out. And we didn't know this at the time, but they were trying to bait us into an ambush because they had two machine gun bunkers lined up right behind each other. And we couldn't see it from where we were. But if we just hit that field just slightly, it would have mowed us in half. Wow. And so, like, okay. And so we're there, and this guy just, the guy comes out, and he, you're like, he's like looking, you know, what's going on? You're like, okay, you can't just shoot a guy for looking. Right. Um, and uh, that's weird. And then I, he stepped out and he got out of the doorway and like just the side of the building. I remember he, he flipped his, I didn't know what it was in the moment, but I was like, what is he putting on his shoulder? And then like, you're building this in real time. You're like, oh my God, it's a rocket launcher. Yeah. Oh my God. And it, you know, cause all rounds have an arc to them. Mm -hmm. So it cut across the field. And I just remember being like, it's just like the video game. Like as it, as the smoke trail came out and then my squad leader Ryan grabbed me and we pulled down behind this wall and it, we didn't know it at the time, but those dirt walls are nigh indestructible, but it hit it. And then it just, they're not oh, indestructible. Oh, they're almost indestructible. Gotcha. Cause they make the bricks and they cover it up and it like, it, it didn't really even have any give to it, but we didn't know that. But at the time he didn't know that either. But at the time he put his body in front of mine and didn't even think twice about it. Wow. And so he like grabbed me and like, I remember he like grabbed me down cause he knew what it was and like pulled me down. And then like we got blown back and then it was literally, I don't want to swear. Um, it literally started raining manure everywhere Yeah, too, because it had, the explosion had also hit uh, a big pile of manure that they were using for like, they would put on their roofs and stuff or also for fires. And so it had liquefied that. So it's like raining manure. And then like, I'm sitting there and I'm like throwing up. And he's like, get up. <laughs> Everyone's like, get up. And so we, I get up and I'm like, and I'm like throwing up and I put my gun over the wall. And I'm just like shooting. I'm like, ah, I think he's there. <laughs> you know, and we're all shooting at him. And then we stayed there for the whole day. And my corpsman, which is our medic, the Navy, I mean, the Marine Corps has a Navy corpsman as docs. And doc comes up to me and he looks at me and goes, Bell, are you okay? And I go, yeah, I'm good. And he goes, don't fall asleep. You'll die. <laughs> and I was like, okay, <laughs> bang, bang. And so we held it for a day. Dang. Yeah. But after that, everything got like better. Like, yeah, it was it, most appointments. They like build up to chaos. That one was just like early onset, but we established like really good dominance of the battle space early on. And like, they knew if they came close, like there's going to be an airstrike. There's going to be artillery. There's going to be something like that. Yeah. And so everything else was pretty, pretty chill after that. Yeah. Um, dang, seven months. Yeah. I didn't call my wife for 90 days. So we're, we what was going on in Iraq at the time? Iraq at that time was scaling down. Yeah. They had what was called the green zone. Do you ever hear about that? Mm -hmm. Like they made a movie about it and stuff. It was like, like a metropolis, honestly. Um, and that was the first time since like 2003 or whatever Marines had been in that area. And it was weird too. Cause you would see stuff. Like we went through a village one time, this old dude came out and he was like saying a whole bunch of stuff, talking trash to us. And I was like, what's his deal? And he goes, Oh, he said, he's not scared of you. He used to kill Russians before you were born. And yeah. I looked at his hands. He was missing fingers. And I was like, oh, yeah, I bet he, I bet he has. Yeah. He's this in, is in Afghanistan. Yeah, he, he just didn't right. care. And you would, like, see, like, because um, when the Russians left, they left everything. Like, you would come across certain places, and there was, like, vehicles that had been left in place that they hadn't been able to scrap. Dang. And it's just, like, it's just a, that's why I call it a graveyard of empires. Like, nobody can conquer it. Yeah. Damn. But we did that for seven months, and then we come home, and start working for the next one yeah what was it like coming home to a seven and a half month old baby it was awesome it was scary um you know i i just you know when you, when you have a child you hold them you're just like oh, yeah this is what it's about you know right. and uh i was like i never ever want to do this again i never yeah. ever want to leave you again. yeah you never want to leave again you know and she's like instantly became my like we picked up right where we left off. You know? Really? Yeah. Like I've never treated my daughters like anything else other than my daughters, if that makes sense. Like I treat them as like I take them. I don't be like, let's do like a girl adventure. I'm like, you're going to do this with me. Mm -hmm. Like you're my best friend. We're going to hang out. Mm -hmm. And um, like whatever I do, they do. And whatever they do, I do. If that yeah. makes sense. Like, um, and so like, I've been going through like photos cause I lost a bunch of stuff on my phone recently and I just got them all back. But it's like, it's just me like carrying her, like we're going to the store, like whatever yeah. I could do to spend time with her, I was going to do it. Right. 
And um, what's her name? The first one, uh, Alyssa is my first daughter. Yeah. Um, so how long was it that you got to spend, you know, just back here in the U.S. with her and your family before you had to go again? Um, I think it's about a year all in. So I get home in like October 2008, and then I leave again for Afghanistan in December 2009. Dang, that's a long little stretch between deployments, isn't it? It is. It wasn't typical of the time. So what it what what that really was because um, we were in Afghanistan in 2007. The election was happening um, with President uh, Obama and uh, <clears throat> uh, Senator McCain. Yeah. So. Policy was changing. Gotcha. And um, all those things that are happening, like, in the background. So he comes into office, I believe it's 08. That's right. That, that feels yeah. right. 8 yeah, to yeah, 12 yeah. and then 12 to 16. So, like, we're there. And, like, obviously that's not going to change. But at that time, they had told us, hey, you're going to Iraq for 90 days. They're like, dude, we're going to Iraq for 90 days? And they're like, yeah, you might get extended. You're like, who cares? Like, being told in 2008 that you're going to Iraq was, like, the greatest gift anyone could have ever told you. Yeah. Why come? It was just, there was nothing going on. We had full control over the place. Um, even the stuff, like, there was no real danger is the nicest way to say it. Mm -hmm. Because we had defeated everything. The Iraqi partners were working well. Like, the green zone was big. Like, your only fear was that you might need bigger camis from eating all the good food and working out so much. Yeah. Right? So I come home and I was like, "Hey, let's, you know, let's uh, let's do this. Like, let's let's make it. Let's make another kid. I want more, I want more of these." And uh, so my wife and I we decided to try for a second child because we wanted one of them close. And uh, thankfully we were able to conceive. And so um, I was like, "Don't worry, you know, if I get extended, it doesn't matter. I'll still be here. I'll get to see all the stuff I missed with uh, Alyssa." And she's like, "Cool, yeah." And so we do that and like. It was going really, really well until President Obama went to West Point in November 2009. Yeah, 2009. And the day he goes there, they're like, hey, you're going to Afghanistan. And I was like, for real? And they're like, yeah, you're going. Like, we just found out he's going to announce it at West Point, the troop surge in Afghanistan, because that was the start of when Afghanistan, like, really ramped up big time. Because until that moment there had been like units on and off going nothing consistent um and so that was how we found out and then i went home and i was like hey guess what this is happening damn yeah and um that that was that was hard that was yeah. hard she was she was so she was pregnant and i was there with you know my daughter Alyssa, and like i just didn't want yeah to do that um, right. I wasn't afraid. Maybe I should have been. I just felt, uh, what's the right word? Guilty. Yeah. I felt guilty for doing this to all of them. That's the way I felt. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, it's your job to provide as a husband and a father. And then I'm like, okay, hopefully I come back, you know, and it's not like the first time I didn't really, I didn't really know what could happen. Yeah. You know, and, um, now I have knowledge. I'm like, well, anything could happen. Right. And so we go back and uh, this we leave in December and People Magazine actually showed up and I didn't like that at all either. Um, but there's a photo that we were able to get and it's just me kissing her belly as she's pregnant and then she's holding our daughter and I was just like, oh man, this, this is tough. Damn. This is tough. Yeah. And uh, we then pushed out. Did the whole thing again. We didn't go to the same place. And what's so weird is like when I left Afghanistan, there was like one big base, Kandahar Airfield, and small bases that were just literally solar shades in the middle of nowhere. We landed at this one place called Dwyer. I remember we came in, we landed there, and they're like, welcome to Camp Dwyer, blah, blah, blah. And they had Wi-Fi. And I was like, bro, I wasn't gone that long. Y'all <laughs> yeah. have the internet now? Like, it's incredible. Just in that small amount of time, they had built up and really like, but so it was obvious they knew that we were coming before we knew. And, um, we then just waited around there until the mission launched into a town called Marja, Afghanistan. And that's that's what I was a part of, an invasion of Marja. Was it as intense as the first deployment? It was worse. Really? Beyond anything else I'd ever experienced. How so? It was, um, it was significantly harder every single day that we were there. It was one of the last Taliban strongholds. The main reason they had so much uh, assets there was because of all the opium that was there. 
and that's what they're using to fund all of their work was harvesting all the opium, turn that into cash, funding their activities. And uh, it was gnarly. It was it was it was absolutely gnarly. Yeah, like we pushed out at first to do like a a security mission, a probing mission, and um, all the leaders went out. All the squad leaders went out, and I was left in charge of the platoon. Me and my friend Nate. And like, I will be back. And so I was made the platoon commander for the time they were gone. I was like, it's okay. They'll be back in a few hours. We could see them. They go out. I see them drive up the road. A few hundred meters. They hit an IED. Boom. Take a casualty. Damn. Yeah, it was someone from the other unit. They get vehicles out there. Vehicles come out there. Boom. Hit another IED. All this stuff happens. They're there the whole time. We start taking fire. Like, we'd only been there a few weeks. We weren't even supposed to really do that much. We were just doing, like, a reconnaissance, like, kind of, like, looking at the lay of the land. Trying, We were trying to figure out how we were going to uh, insert ourselves for the assault of this town. And, like, we were gathering information, like, could we come up this road? Could we go here? Or we just got to land in the center of it, which is what we did. Like, what can we do? And um, it was... I remember like watching it being like, oh no. And then they finally got all the guys out with the leaders recon. They called me on the way back. They're like, hey, Bell, you're the platoon commander for the foreseeable future. Good luck. <laughs> Have yeah. fun. And I was like, okay. Yeah. So for like the next 48 hours, me and my friend, like we ran the patrol base and, um, you know, I had a lot of good people there helping me and stuff, but it was, it was just, it was scary in the moment because, you know, I was the one who'd been left in charge. And I was just like, okay, we just, this just needs to go well. And, um, you know, we had about 30 Afghan soldiers with the too, so altogether about 60 some odd people and uh, everything that was on the base as well, the little patrol base. And, you know, waited a long time, not a long time, waited two days so they came back. I was up the whole time. I didn't sleep once. And Dang. then they came back and I slept for like 12 hours. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we did that. And uh, we did a few missions out of there. And um, at at that time, I was trying to get a Red Cross message um, home because my wife was supposed to have given birth to our second daughter, Audrey. And, uh, you know, due to all of the news we got late and everything else that happened, I was just so nervous and, uh, for her and I hadn't heard and all my friends that I would see be like, Hey, have you heard anything? You know, everyone's trying to communicate. And there were these French reporters that were with us. And, uh, uh, Brian was like, Hey, <laughs> they're they're your responsibility. And I was like, please no, don't give me, don't give me, don't give me reporters, much less French reporters. Come on, Ryan. yeah, you know. And he's like, you got to take care of them. Cool. And reporters, depending on who they are, they're either too brave or not brave enough, right? right. Some of them have been around there for a while. They're really cool. They're, they'll do whatever, you know. Some of them don't know what they're doing, and they just put you and themselves at a great risk. They just have cameras. And so we go out, we push, and we take fire, and you know. I can't remember their names. Jock, let's just call him Jock and his his friend. They we start taking rounds and they drop. I mean, they they hit the ground like pancakes, flat like crepes. And I'm like, all right, dude, we gotta go. It's good, it's good. You get down at first, now we gotta move. And he's like, No, 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 we are not moving. And I was like, You're gonna move or you're gonna die. Like, we gotta get out of the we're in the middle of this field. It's as flat as this table. There's nowhere to hide, there's no cover, there's no concealment. We've gotta move. No, 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 no. And I was like, All right, fine. I grab the back of his flag and I drag him, like as I'm re- I'm dragging with this hand, like as I'm shooting rounds, as we try to get to a different position. We then get to cover. We continue on with the mission. You know, we see some more stuff. We then go back, and uh, we're on our way back. And uh, we get to the the door of the we get to the entryway to our position. And I'm I set up what's called a mako gate. So I start counting people: one, two, three, four. You know, and then I give it to Ryan. Ryan, we're good, good. All numbers good. He calls in. You know, hey you know, back inside friendly lines. And so while he's doing that, I'm talking to Jock, and he's like, Monsieur, you have saved my life. I'm so grateful. I'm sorry if it's a bad French accent. It's okay, I saved his life. Don't get mad at me. Yeah. Don't cancel me or rodeo time, France. It's all right. <laughs> I apologize for the French listeners. No worries. Um, But he's like, you saved my life. I'm so grateful. If you have a dignity from me, you just let me know. And he gives me this card, which I've lost, of course. And it was something, something Associated Press. And I was like, that's a big deal. That's kind of a big paper. And he's like, whatever you need. I'm so grateful. And I go, okay, here's the deal, man. I'm glad I was able to save your life. I appreciate that. But my daughter, uh, my wife is pregnant with my second child. I don't know how she's doing. It's been a while. At this point, we're like a few days ahead of the rest of the world. I'm worried. I want to know what's happening. 
can I borrow your cell phone? And he goes, ah, cell phone? And I was like, <laughs> yes, your cell phone. He goes, I do not have a cell phone. I go, you don't have a cell phone? He goes, we. Oui. I go, okay. So you're from the Associated Press. We. Oui. They sent you out here to report on the war. We. Oui. And you don't have a cell phone? We. Oui. Okay. By this time, like, all my Marines are around me, and they're well aware of, like, what's happening. And I'm talking to him, and I'm, like, posturing. And they're, like, looking at him, and he's, like, looking at me. And I'm, like, so, all right, Jock, here's the deal. I know you got a cell phone, because I know they didn't send you out here for no reason without a cell phone. But I'm going to need you to give it to me. So I'm going to call home, and I'm going to ask my wife how my daughter is, and that's going to be the end of it. And if you don't do that, I'm going to take you back out there, and I'm going to leave <laughs> you, and no one's going to stop me, and there's nothing you can do about it. And he's, like, looking at me, and he, like, looks over my shoulder, and the greatest thing my Marines have ever done were just like, yeah, we'll, we'll do it, Lumiere. Like, they're, like, cracking their knuckles. They're like, you better give that guy a cell phone. And uh, he opens up his flak. He reaches across to me, and he, he hands me uh, a cell phone. He goes, America's country code is zero one. And I go, right it is <laughs> and so i I, t I take the phone i take the phone and i dial the number and i call my wife like as i'm looking out into the distance and like things are happening and i go hey how are you how is she and we talk it's felt like forever but it was just 30 like i don't know less than a minute and i go I love you don't ever call this number again it belongs to a french reporter i'll talk to you soon click yeah that's, that's how i found out my Dang. My, my second daughter, Audrey, was born. That's crazy that he, like, whatever you need. It was unless, a, unless you're trying to use my minutes. <laughs> yeah. Dude, it was, so, it was like he was paying for him. I was like, you know, Mr. Associated Press is going to cover the charges. Why was he so hesitant? I don't know because I just saved his life. Like, he was, had he not, had I not pulled him out of that field, right. it, the best thing is they would have, like, killed him. But it, most likely they would have tortured him and, like, tried to. Yeah, done everything. Ra ransom him. Yeah, but he instantly, instantly was like, "No, I just, I'll never forget him." Be like, "No," <laughs> like his hands were up, like, you know, anything you need. Yeah, can I get a ride to yeah. this gas station? Oh, except for that. Yeah, except for that. <laughs> except for that. I didn't wasn't and it wasn't much. Like I was just like looking. I just remember like looking, and there was like explosions happening. Like as I'm talking to my wife, and I was like, oh, "Dude, I can't keep doing this." That's so crazy. There's always those people in life. Whenever they yeah. say like, "Hey, if you need anything, let me know," and yeah, and. You wonder sometimes if they mean it or not. He did not mean it. <laughs> you saved this man's life. Yeah. And he no. wouldn't let you borrow his cell phone. Yeah. It's, what in the world? Like, why would he? I, do you know at all, like, why he wouldn't? Like, is there some I don't, sort of. I don't know. There's, there's, I wasn't breaking any rules. Like, if I was like, I'm at position one, two, three, four. Right. My wife wouldn't have even known what that is. Like, yeah. there's, there's literally no reason to not do it. Yeah. Um, the only thing that would be negative is other people might ask him for the cell phone but like as soon as i got off the phone i hung it up and i go i go uh she's she's good and i've got a i've got a beautiful baby girl and like all my friends erupted yeah like, yeah, yeah. they of all course. knew like we were all waiting for this moment and then i got a red cross message after like no one ever did you not know the gender at the time well no but i just said it like i got a beautiful baby girl you yeah, know yeah, yeah um and like not long after that we got back to a, uh the big base because we were going to do a different part of the mission and a bunch of cigars came in, and so me and my friends, we all smoked cigars, and, you know, we had some uh, junk food, which my wife had sent to for me and all my friends, and so we have a photo about a week later of all of us just smoking cigars. Did you have to hang out with that guy anymore? No, he left. Yeah. yeah he left. That's the thing. They were that, that deployment was so covered that you can Google it. They made documentaries about it. Yeah. They did all these things, and I don't like any of it. Right. Um uh just because it's such a big part of my life and my family's life and so many different people's lives that it it makes me somewhat uncomfortable of the hyper commercialization that happened afterwards yeah like um there's a cup the marine corps sells that i still have and it's got all the top battles of the marine corps famous things mm -hmm. you know guadalcanal iwo jima all these different things and the last one listed is marja like as mm -hmm. you like look on it i'm like i don't know I don't know. I feel like everyone else there was did stuff to be recognized as heroes, but when I look at it, I, I don't I don't feel that way. I don't know. Yeah. Um and um, uh, you know, we when we went back after that to get ready for the big mission, you know, February thirteenth, twenty ten, 
you know, we're waiting there and then we go and we so assault. same deployment, same deployment. So we left this, we left the outer ring and then they're like, cause like I said, they were trying to develop a plan of how to penetrate the city. Mm-hmm. So we were all like, we were probing the security sectors, the security ring is what it was called. And so they're like, well, there's no way in through the out. You guys are going to land dead center in the middle of town and then push out. Cool. And so we did that February 13th, 2010 is when the mission launched. And, uh, we went in, they were like, yeah, there's going to be anti-aircraft fire, all this stuff. You know, birds only be on the ground for like less than 30 seconds. You got to get off. We had to carry, um, uh, I can't remember what it's called now, an APOP, I think is what it's called. It's used to clear um, minefields. We had to carry those. They're huge. They're not meant to be carried by people. So we had to like retrofit like literally duct tape and like PVC pipe to like carry them like over our shoulders to clear like these IED laden fields. Mm. And, uh, yeah, we just went there and the first, the first two weeks were like pretty, pretty good. There was no one there. They waited for us to settle. And then every, every day after that was, a was, con- was contact every single day, Damn, every single day. So like when you give a patrol brief, you talk about the type of patrol you're going to do and you're like, is it going to be a contact combat patrol, security patrol, whatever. Every single patrol was a combat patrol. That's how I briefed it. That's how it was briefed to me. And uh, that means it's not like if we see the enemy, it's when we see the enemy. Mm. And uh, we took a lot of casualties, a lot of casualties, um, lost a lot of good people. So much so they had to rearrange uh, my platoon. And I went from being a first team leader, which is, I was like second in command of the rifle squad, to I then um, ended up becoming a squad leader myself. And, uh, you know, our platoon had, taken, had, had lost someone so incredible and... Uh, all those things that happened, it was just like, I don't, I don't know, but there was, you know, I was approached by the leadership and I said, I would, you know, whatever I can do to get these guys home, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. And, you know, yeah, every night I would pray, like, whatever happened, just take me, don't let it, don't let anybody go. And I did the best I could. I did everything I could. I gave it every single bit of, of, uh, effort that I could. And that happened in May, and that continued on until July when we came back, and that was actually when the fighting had, like, increased the most. Um, because at that time, I'd walk through the fields, right? And I'd see poppies, and they're actually really gorgeous plants. But when they would start to get green and they would swell and you would squeeze them, kind of feel like a juicy orange. And you're like, okay, they haven't harvested this yet. Because when they take it, they take the bulb and they scrape it, the side of it, so the uh, opium comes out. They'll milk it, milking the poppies, but they don't pierce it because if you pierce it, it messes it all up. So they've got to like scrape it and it comes out like tar. Some of them even like this little finger tool to like score it so it pours out or they'll like take the side of a can, slice it, and then like rotate the can as it pours out. And so then I would see them and I'm like, oh no, they've they've milked these. That's bad. And then if I would go through and I squeeze it and they would crush in my hand, they haven't, they've milked it and harvested. That means the Everything's been cultivated, and that means they have money for heroin, which then is money for, um, to fund all of their activities against us. Dang. And so if it, as soon as they started cracking in my hand, I was like, okay. And so that carries on April, May, June, as the summer happens, and that's when, like, literally every day, bang, 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 every day. Dang. Yeah. Complex ambushes, you'd be in the middle of a field, um, stuff would start happening. They started setting up, uh, like, traps for us, all sorts of different things. Because they just knew. You know, they were watching us all the time. And so it was never a thing of like us not doing the right thing. It was just a thing of like how intense the battle space was. Mm. So and they were constantly like changing and evolving. Yeah. yeah. Constantly. Constantly. Like there was never a day where I was like, it's okay today. Like it was, it was like, hey, you walk out, we walk outside the wire, your eyes are, your eyes and ears are open. Like, you know, stuff would happen that, Nobody did anything wrong. One of my friends lost both of his legs. You know, they were just, they were doing everything right. Still, the vehicle had been blown up so many times that it, it, it failed, it basically, and the blast was able to penetrate the hole. All right? Like, nothing nothing wrong had happened. It's just like, yeah, it, it, it's a game of numbers, right? So, like, the more times you go out, the more opportunity there is for combat, and then it just continues and continues and continues. Yeah. And so... After all that stuff had happened when they came to me and they're like, hey, do you want to re-enlist? And I was like, no, I don't want to re-enlist. I don't want yeah. to re-enlist at all. Because I'd missed so much of my wife and my family and I'd seen so much there that I was like, I can't keep doing this. It's crazy because, uh, you know, 
I don't I don't know. Rodeo is all I know. I'm yeah. not trying to compare. No. I, I am comparing. I'm not comparing the stakes. The stakes are obviously much different. You can die doing it, right? Yeah. Yeah. The the odds of that happening are far less, you know. But I guess one similarity would be that like there are ways in rodeo to mitigate risk, you yeah. know, like there's a when you get you can go at it haphazardly and you are at much greater risk of getting injured mm-hmm. and or dying. You can, for instance, shoot procedure, how you get on a bull, yeah. how you get on a bronc, like while they're in the chute, the way you treat that animal up until the point that he leaves the chute. During the ride, most everybody's usually okay. Um, it's when you're getting bucked off or getting off that you um, have another chance at getting injured. And so there's things that you can do there for instance, whenever in the bronc riding, mm-hmm. you roll to your belly, you know, because what happens is when you come off the horse, okay, if you roll to your belly, the way your foot is in the stirrup, it'll twist that foot over and it won't catch on the stirrup as often. So you don't get dragged. So you don't get drugged behind a bucking horse. So, okay. so there's things that you do, you know, which side of the bull to get off on, depending on the bareback and the bull riding. So there's a lot of little things you can do, but Somewhere, for instance, this last year, um, I've got two close friends that got injured real bad, mm. um, career ending injuries. One of them being JB, yeah. you know, broke his neck. And then the other one, Jacobs Crawley broke his back. And, um, in both scenarios, it wasn't anything they had done wrong, Yeah, you know? And, um, that's the thing when interns come in and they're wanting to learn the new sport and learn how to ride bulls. First, I have to tell them like, all right, before you, I try to talk them out of it. Yeah. You could die. You know, we're going to do all the things we can to, uh, lower that risk, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's still a chance, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's ways you can go about the sport to increase it and there's ways you can go to decrease it, but it's never zero. Mm-hmm. And that's what, you know, just reading and listening and watching, you know, you guys over the last 20 some odd years, it's, it's like you could be going about your job and do everything right and just happen to be standing in the wrong place. Yeah. And at the wrong time. And it could happen to, it's, it's so wild because I'm sure there's this, there's this, there's gotta be this feeling of like, what did I do? Or because you, you're always trying to take response as much responsibility as you can, you know, as a response, you know, as a, Stand up guy. Yeah. But there comes a point where it's just like, hey, this was nobody's fault. It just happened. Well, and especially in the military, uh, after something happens, no matter what, you do an after action report. So you're literally thinking about it the immediate, like, you're like, okay, write this down. Uh huh. And so there is, a, there is a lot of that. But like, me and my friends would talk about it. It's just like, statistically, you're just rolling the dice. Like, yeah. You've gone, you've gone another deployment. You know, there's 210 days, you're in active combat, you're patrolling at least once a day, like mathematically something's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And like, I looked at my life through the lens of doing that for the next 20 years. And, you know, my, my wife, to her credit, she always says she would have loved to have done it and would have never left me or done anything or wouldn't have like protested. But yeah, had you been a lifer? Yeah. And we talked about it. We talked about it a lot. Like one of the plans I wanted to do was uh, I wanted to like transition into the officer program. So they have a program where you go from enlisted to an officer. I didn't know any of this prior to going in. I thought they just like pick you and they're like, you're an officer now. <laughs> like I yeah. didn't know you had to go to college yeah, to be an officer. And um, that was one of the things we talked about doing just because like the quality of life is so much higher as an officer. Um, the stress and the burden of command is significantly harder, but like, um, you know, you can't shoot, move, and communicate forever anyways. So, like, I have I so quickly, like, got to a point in my career where, like, you know, once you get, like, sergeant into staff sergeant, like, E5 into E6, you start going from, like, shooting and moving and communicating to, like, now you're just counting. You're, like, administratively in charge. Like, you're a manager as opposed to, like, an operator. And, like, there's things you can do to, like, stay operational. Like, you can move to, like, a sniper platoon or you can move to, like, marsoc or different things like that but even still no matter what there's a small amount of time that you can operate right and so it's like okay well what can i do like okay well i could be like a an officer and i could be a lieutenant or first or second lieutenant or a captain or i can be still in the infantry but i'll be leading and i could take my experience i have as enlisted and carry that over you know those are like plans and stuff we laid out and i still wanted to go to college too like i wanted that's something i'd always said i wanted to do i want to be the first person in my family to do that 
ever. Yeah. And so that was like a path laid before me. But I just, you know, I just saw myself like leaving her and the kids for the rest of my life. And I just, I didn't want to do that to them. I just couldn't, I couldn't do it, you know? Um, and my hat goes off to anyone who does. It's so hard. It's one of the most uh, selfish and selfless things that you can do as a person is dedicating your life uh, to some form of service like that. You know, it is it is selfish because all those involved in your life are, are following you and kind of subject to whatever that career, that path, whatever it is, you know, firefighter, cop, military. If you're a pastor, like all those different things, any form of service, like mm-hmm. you, it is somewhat of a selfish act in a sense, but the selflessness comes in that dedication to helping your community, mm-hmm. wherever, whatever community it is. Yeah. So like with rodeo, like, the first, I don't know, it's a selfish endeavor. Yeah. You know, because it it revolves around this one person doing that one thing that they have a dream to do. Yeah. And it it involves you being in another town each day that you do it. Each day? Well, yeah. So, yeah. like, uh, if, if, I, if I was going to go to three rodeos this weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday... They're going to be in three different towns. No way. Most rodeos. So like if you had a rodeo in a town, uh, Graham here close to us has one, for instance. It's a three-day rodeo. Well, you don't compete every night in the same town. What they'll do is, is let's say there's 10 guys each night. They're all entered in the same rodeo. It's just 10 guys each night, and then the winner is determined Saturday night. Okay. So let's that's 30 guys total entered, but you can pick which night you want to what you want to ride in so you might go to graham thursday night and you might go to you know bridgeport friday and then over to decatur saturday and then saturday night will determine how you did in all three of those rodeos you'll call around hey who who ended up winning you know but the point is if you're rodeoing hard and you're trying to go everywhere you know you may have three rodeos and they're in another state and oh uh. So there's a lot of strategy yeah. in making sure you enter rodeos close to each other, whatever. The point is that um, doing your job in this line of work means typically you are away from home. Mm-hmm. And it's to, when you go to those places, all three of those towns I mentioned, usually in that town, that is the party that they that town is throwing for the year. So you are literally going to a different party in a different town each night for your work. And <clears throat> you're selling me. I mean, I've I've been here for less than a day and I'm I'm yeah, looking at land, I'm doing all sorts of stuff. <laughs> well, it it's it's yeah. it's not only appealing on when you're rodeoing like going down the road, but also like once you get in the fight of the challenge of you know, riding a bronc or riding a bull, that also the adrenaline will lure you in too of like actually competing and trying to accomplish, you know. And so there's the actual bronc ride that's fun. There's the actual rodeoing and going to a different party in a different town every night that's fun. Yeah. And anyhow, I guess I'm just trying to connect our worlds because like I see it as overall, like, and I'll, you know, the guys that come to the program, like it's better if you are, making money rodeoing before you have a family just because you know as cool as she may be it's a lot easier for her to justify watching you walk out the door with or without kids if she knows that there's a high probability you're going to come back with a check that night yes but if you're learning to rodeo and you're because you still got to go rodeo if you're leaving and you're going to go get on a bull or a bronc and it's a high probability that you won't come back because you're a year away from making a living at it. Well, it's going to be harder for her to justify watching you leave to go to a party. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, so, Oh, I know. Yeah. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a, that's half the reason I want to be an officer because the, the pay's like double instantly. yeah, Yeah. So there you go. You're going over to this, to do this job that you enjoy. That's dangerous that you may not come back from to make not very much money. And I, I could see the problem being, you're not being forced to go over there. It wasn't a draft. No, there was you know, not. Which they, that's a whole nother. I mean, not that that would be easier, but <laughs> well, no. And they were offering. Uh, they were offering. Uh, they offered me at that time thirty thousand dollars. I think it was to reenlist. To reenlist. Yeah. Like it, I had a like, I think it was. Uh, I don't quote me or cancel me. It was. It was. It was roughly around that 
It was 20 plus thousand something. There were other incentives, but I imagine that probably wasn't a big factor in your decision making though, was it? No. Compared to compared to hanging out with your two kids. No, well, that was the thing, but the rules were I had to I had to deploy in like 18 months. So it was a contract specifically built around me deploying again. Like yeah. you don't get the money, like you have to be in a unit that's deployed in this amount of time to get this. And the other thing is what if they didn't deploy you till 19 months? Yes. What if it was their fault? Well, then you still I'm don't get the money. I'm sure that. they would have found a way to take it back. Yeah. 100%. Or honestly, I heard they were they moved guys around. Like if you came up to that line, they're like, no, you go here. And then which, they just. Which is definitely what I didn't want to do. I don't, you don't want to show up with like a bunch of different people and like you have to trust them. It's just not what I'm going to do. And, uh, you know, I talked to my leadership and stuff and I was just like, man, I can't, I, I, I can't do this. I can't, I can't do this for the rest of my life because like no matter what. The thing you want in the military is, I imagine, as much like when you're rodeoing, is you want to be there with the people you started with, you know, because that's like your group. It's like your class. Yeah. But, like, we all, no matter what, we were all going to go our separate ways no matter what. Well, one thing I'll say is you definitely want to have control over who you rodeo with. Yes. It may not necessarily be the people you started with, but, like, I'm not going to go down the road with somebody that's not making me better. Yes. But I imagine the military... If you don't like your guy standing next to you, you can't necessarily just change it. No. I mean, you, you're you with them every single day. You yeah. know, work, sleep, everything. You're with them every single day. And, like, I just, I don't know. And it's so hard, too, because you know it as well from riding. Like, that adrenaline rush, when you're riding that fine line between life and death, there is literally nothing else like it. And that's that's what combat is. It's, it's that. I imagine it's the same as being on the back of an animal you can't control and you're just holding on for, what is it, eight seconds? Mm -hmm. Like, that's, it, you're... Like when you get up and you can like smell color, you're like, oh yeah, this is great. That adrenaline rush and there's nothing else like it. You're not going to go work at enterprise. You're not going to yeah. you know, be an accountant after that. Like a hundred percent. And it's hard. And I wish some part of me wishes that it, it didn't happen. But when it hit me that, that, yeah, whoa, <laughs> like I was like, oh, there's no going back now. Like the world's color, you know, it's not black and white. And, uh, you know, I was just like, I can't, I can't do this. I'll, I'll figure out a way to funnel this energy. I'll put it somewhere else, but I, I can't do this. I want to go home. I want to, you know, I want to be there for my wife. I want to be there for my kids, whatever they want to do. I want to, I'm in support. Like I'm not, I'm not the guy anymore. Yeah. And so that's, that's what we decided to do. And we decided to move to uh, Nashville, Tennessee. So then what'd you do? What uh, year is it? 2011. 2011. Yeah. So there was apparently a housing crisis that I was somewhat unaware of. That happened. The whole housing market collapsed. I mean, I did know about it, but at the same time, I didn't. I had other things to worry about. A little distracted. A little distracted. So, and that's why a lot of people at that time were telling me specifically to stay in the military because, like, it's a job. Yeah. I'm like, guys, you really don't understand, like, what you're telling me to do. And uh, I want to go to college. So, I uh, en enrolled in a university in uh, Middleton. Did the GI Bill help you? Yes. That? Yes. The GI nice. Bill is incredible. Yeah. It's absolutely incredible. And it only got better. It's only gotten better since then. But at that time, it was still kind of, this is 2011. Not everyone's really understanding all the rules associated with it. And there was only one uh, university that took it um, at that time. And so... In? in Middle Tennessee. It was in, in Tennessee. Yeah. Well, and near me in Middle Tennessee. Like, yeah. it's just, they didn't understand the filing stuff associated with it. Now schools have a have VA officials who literally like work at the school. And it's just their job to do GI Bill stuff. You bet. This had not happened yet. Right. This is really early. Um, and uh, I was going to school, and, you know, I had a 1.67 at Memphis, and uh, I don't want to brag, but that's not good. Yeah. Um, and so I went there, and I had to do remedial everything, uh -huh. and it was super humbling. And I was like, okay, that's fine, you know. And I even, like... You know, uh, I am a Marine. Yeah, I am a Marine. And like, <laughs> you know, I, I tried to, I tried to blend in, but they I actually didn't care about your former, former no, they, schooling. No, just no like, they didn't. I, I was, just heard Marine. Yeah, I, was just, <laughs> um, I even had this thing where I, I went to this English class and this, this teacher comes in, he has a scarf, everything, you know, he's like an English teacher in a college and he's like, welcome. My name is so-and-so here is the syllabus. Do not ask me questions that are on the, he's like doing this like real theatrical thing, you know, and I'm 24. I right. think it was at that time, 23, 24. And like everyone else is just like, oh, okay. And it, and he's like, make sure all your papers are in. He gives this whole speech. This He's like, if your paper papers are not in MLA format, you will fail this class. And I was just like, I was like looking around. And I was like, what's in my 
what's MLA format? What is that? What is he talking about? I have no idea what this guy's saying. Yeah. You know? And, um, I walked up to him and I go, Hey sir, my name's Zachary Bell. You know, I just wanted to ask you some more questions. Uh, what is MLA format, sir? And he goes, son, were you not in high school just six months ago? And I go, no, sir, I was not six months ago. I was in Afghanistan. And I would appreciate it if you didn't talk to me so rudely and just help me understand what's going on. And he just like looked at me and he goes, thank you for your service. So MLA format is like, <laughs> and he started walking me through it. But like, I was like, okay, this is going to be harder than I thought. And I got tutors. I got all those things. And I worked after school and everything. And um, I tried to get a job for a long time. And I couldn't get a job anywhere. I couldn't get a job anywhere. And there was a flood that happened in Nashville. And my father-in-law did construction, repairing um, everything. And so what he did was he would let me work with him during the days. And then, like, once a week, he would let me go interview for jobs. And the only place I could get a job was a hospital in town where I was a medical receptionist uh, on the night shift. Hey, so, you so, were really looking. Yeah. Um, and there's, I mean, there's nothing I won't do. Yeah. There's nothing I won't do. And I feel like if there's anything I want people to embrace in life, don't be afraid to do anything. Take pride in it, whatever it is you're doing, but do it. And um, there was no option. I wanted a home. We were living with my mother-in-law. She took care of us. She let us stay there while we were trying to find a place. But it's me, you know, it's me, my wife, my two daughters living in her um, her house she graciously rearranged it for us. Dang. And um, I couldn't find anything. And, like, I'm like, dude, there's pride isn't real. But was there still, like... So in that moment, you're a medical receptionist. How, yeah. how long after you got out was that? Oh, that was... Uh, I started there in June of 2011. So how many months after? February. So I had some time in February. Okay, so, so a few for, months, yeah. yeah. So but was there still moments, like... You're living with your in-laws, halfway working for them. Now you've got the graveyard shift mm -hmm. as like borderline secretary type job. I was a secretary. I was, yeah. Um, were there still moments when you were like, man, at least I'm not getting shot at? Yes, that that was definitely there. Um, you know, because I remember, this is different, but yeah. I remember getting out of college and I'd been there for six years. Yeah. And Show had been... Off. Tw yeah. yeah. Well, I took a victory lap. No. Yeah. Um, so 12 plus 6, 18 years of school. Uh-huh. And for the first time in my life, there were no more deadlines. And it would it took like a year where I would be like, oh, man, that's all. Because I'd be like, oh, what's due? You know, because 18 years, that's yeah, yeah. a long time. Yeah. And so, like, that that followed me for a good while. Uh, you know, it was like a, of just like a, re a sense of relief. Yeah. Two or three times a day where I was just like, oh, man, there's nothing to do. I don't have this or that. And how long did that that last for you? It's like not only do I not have to do PT or yeah. get up at 4.30 a.m., but I don't, I'm not getting shot at. How long did that last? That probably lasted a year. I mean, I, the wheels kind of came off a little like bit. Like you probably had a good attitude, even graveyard I loved it. shift. I loved it. Like when yeah. people complain, that it's the one thing, it's the one bad thing about like – You were eating MREs. Yeah. In Afghanistan. Yeah. Six months earlier. And, like, so this is 2011, so for some context, like, Instagram and things like that weren't really that popular yet. Yeah. And so, like, no one knew who I was in the sense of beyond what they saw. And at that time, I used to have to get a haircut every Sunday in the Marine Corps. I didn't get a haircut for a while. Like, I leaned into the college experience. Probably still weighed, like, 150. I, yeah. I was, yeah, I was just, just like a guy that they didn't know there was some guy who used to be in the military who's now a medical receptionist. And the job that elderly women, for the most part, held, actually. Right. <laughs> and they were very nice women. They taught me everything. They're so incredible to me. Yeah. And it was just me on night shift. And so this was, for three years I did this. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I would go to school. Sometimes I would have labs. And I would um, go from school to like 8 to 12. And then I would um, sleep in my car. Kind of take a, I would eat lunch, sleep in my car. I would then get up around three or four, work out, and then I would drive from Murfreesboro, Tennessee to Nashville to the hospital. And then I would work 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. And then I would go to sleep again and then start my day over. Yeah. That's what I did for three years. Three years? Three years I did that, yeah. You worked a graveyard shift uh -huh. at that hospital for three years? Yeah. yeah. How much an hour did it pay? It paid better than anything else. I can't remember exactly what it was. I want to say it's like twelve to fifteen, but you got like extra stipends uh, because of um, 
uh, because being, it's a graveyard. Yeah, and it's that's well, I could honestly the thing that starts happening to you is it starts messing with the rest of your life because you'll try to like work with like daytime people like your family's yeah. on a graveyard so you like yeah try to balance that and then like it messes you up and yeah like, you want to play with your kid at 1 p.m but you're that's yes that'd be like 1 a.m yes it's it's brutal for it, you it's absolutely brutal and um i but i i couldn't find anything and i'm really grateful for it but i would go to i mean with, without sounding like negative or something the job was so blissfully easy that the 12 hours of work that I was working, I was done in an hour. Like right. I was, I was yeah, literally yeah, yeah. done in an hour every night. So I was literally just making note cards, like flashcards for like stuff that I was studying. Oh, so, so you were able to do some, I was able to do my work. And of course they it probably didn't bother them. It's three in the morning. Nothing's going on. They just want you to be awake. Yeah, realistically. Be awake. Cause yeah. no, my, not many people know there's been hosp hospitals are kind of like cities. They're kind of always moving, but at night they just want you to at night. The goal in a hospital is to maintain and no change. Right. So just whatever happened during the day, wait until the doctor comes in to give his orders. You just do whatever's ordered and just maintain that, yeah. that that kind of baseline. And so it's my job to like do that. And you know, patients would come in with different things, and I got to meet a bunch of people. Man, that's a life hack. Yeah, is a night receptionist at a hospital. Yeah, it's it's no high risk. There's nothing to it. People be like, "What do you do?" And I'm like, oh, "I'm just this." And they're like, "Well, you're a guy." And I go, "Yeah, I don't care." Like, and it was it was, and I became friends with like some really good people. And this one guy, um, Rowdy. Rowdy and Tyler, my boys, they looked out for me big time. They were like telling me I should look into nursing and do like nurse practitioner at the time because it would hit all my buckets of dangerous and helping. I always like Did help. you think about it? Yes. That's crazy. I wanted to do it because um, so this is a bit, I was at Vanderbilt and Vanderbilt has life flight. So you would be on a helicopter, you fly in the middle of nowhere, you take someone in the worst situation possible, you then get them, it's your job to keep them alive and get them back. You're on a helicopter, adrenaline's racing, you're doing your job. It hits every single thing of like, I love helping people. I think we find the best version of ourselves in the service of others. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's dangerous. You're on a hell, all these things. Boom, boom, boom. That's what I wanted to do. And, uh, I remember they were like, always like walking me through this stuff, help me with like all my science classes and everything. Like really good people that like when I needed friends, they were there for me. And I remember I just started like posting photos on Instagram and it was like one year anniversary of me in Afghanistan and the charge nurse who's like in the head nurse of all everyone in the shift, she comes up to me and she goes, Hey, is this you? And it's like me with like a grenade launcher and like my, my Marines behind me. I go, yeah. She goes, this was you, this was you. And I go, yeah, well, I don't understand. She's like, why are you here? And I go, I don't know. <laughs> it's the only job I can find. It's, it's the only job I can get. Yeah. And she goes, I had no idea. And I was like, yeah, I, I know it's, it's fine. Thank you. And then like, as soon as that happened, everything else is different. They're like, Whoa. And like the, the doctors would come up to me and be like, you know, what's up, dude? They would like talk to me, like they would like bro out with me. A little bit be like, yeah, whatever. Look at this guy, Zach. Like they would talk to me, like <laughs> they would make fun of the other doctors in front of me, like he's such a boot. Like they was like, yeah. Yeah, 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 he is dumb. Like it was weird. Yeah. Oh, that's but, hilarious. But it's like I instantly became like larger than life in that aspect. As a, until yeah. then, I was just a guy that filed paperwork that was just like doing homework. Right. And it was, it was pretty fun. But uh, what was your wife doing at the time? So she was work. She was a um, preschool teacher, but we had always wanted um, her to be able to do as much as she can with, with the girls. And uh, both of them uh, started out in gymnastics, but really took to competitive cheerleading big time. Nice. And so we uh, were able to. She's she's now like like a mom momager, like a manager of them and their like professional yeah, careers yeah, yeah. and stuff. Because sure. like I mean, like when I was texting you, like we were in New Orleans at a cheer competition, and like I've got like three more in the next two months we're traveling like that dang yeah but they love it yeah and you know so when i was at the hospital i found out about another school in nashville that was had a new gi bill program mm -hmm. um, for private university where you could transfer over and get credits and stuff and so I, all my friends at this at the hospital told me to do it and i ended up getting in i started doing it and you know, I ended up changing my major to psychology because I wanted to do like post grad stuff there, mm -hmm. and um, that also led me to like some other things, like working with nonprofits, and then like that was like when I really like found my calling was right. like working with veterans organizations, and I did that for like the next six, seven years, ten yeah. years altogether. Actually, I started working in that field, and um, I really just, you know, because by that time I had started losing friends. Um, who had taken their own life and uh, it just started to spread. It just started to spread like wildfire. 
and like there was no real pattern to it. It just started to like take people one by one by one by one. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, well, no one's helping us the way I feel we need to be helped. So I'm going to start doing it. Yeah. So I just kind of became this guy who's going around with veterans groups, talking to people about veteran stuff, talking to people about mental health and the things that we avoid and like how to help each other. And that was really, you know, the path that, you know, God had put before me, I'd always thought was that I would go in some form of medicine or healing to help people because I just like to help people. I love it. I don't, yeah, I don't care if I'm recognized. I don't really want it. You know, I just, I like it because you know, it comes from a, you know, my grandfather once helped a man on the side of the road that's broke down. And I just remember being like, you know, you just always got to pay it forward. Yeah. You know, that's what we're supposed to do for each other. And so that just kind of stuck with me. So, um, so what are you doing now? Now, now I'm, uh, well, now I hold up cardboard. Yeah. Now, now I, now I try to like, you know, make messages and stuff and, um, try and tell people about like mental health services and organizations and companies that help you know, people find peace beyond the battlefield. I mean, you know, I was at a big, big hospital, I'm a big, big healthcare company in 2020, but you know, um, I had started veteran with a sign in March of that year and I was just like, Hey, you know, just like do this. Right. You know, it's just me like that. Yeah. And uh, maybe it'll make people laugh and maybe it'll be something fun. Maybe it'll be different. And, you know, at first, as you know, comments on the internet are, they're specific. A lot of stuff about my body, a lot of stuff about my tattoos, and they didn't really get what I was doing at first because I wear the same thing every time or I try to. Yeah. But that's because I'm trying to reduce me as the idea and just like me as the message. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was just, kind of gnarly at first but just kept pushing through it i was like there's something here this feels the comments were it's not so much the tone started to change and i just kept going and kept going and kept going until it just popped one day because um there was that navy captain who got relieved of command um uh, for um he had told cbs that all of his ship had sailors with covid and the navy was upset that he had said that and they relieved him of his command and so there's this clip of people just like jumping up and down screaming Captain Crozier because as a leader, you're supposed to do things that are good for your troops, no matter what the consequences. And he wanted to get these kids the help, the help they needed. And so they didn't like that. And so he got relieved. And so I made a sign that said, bring back Captain Crozier. And it just, that was it just took yeah. off. And, you know, and, you know, now I'm at a place where I'm trying to expand the messages be on the cardboard. So I've even started a podcast. It's no rodeo time podcast, but I'm doing the best I can, you know? Yeah. And what, uh, um, so what all do you do within that? You've got sponsors. Yeah. I've got some sponsors that have really helped out, um, with me. They've, they've, uh, wanted to help get their messaging out about like, you know, one company, uh, is called like Remedical. They help veterans with their disability claims, which mm -hmm. I think is the first step people need to get addressed so they can get their claims done and their health care all the benefits they uh, deserve taken care of. Um, Cause if you don't have that, that access to care, like it's just a slippery slope down from there. And like, I like what they're doing and like, I'm, I'm just trying to help the community out. That's, that's my whole, I'm trying to be the Dale Brisby of veterans. Like there you go. The disciple you are for the rodeo world. I'm trying to be that for us. And then bridge those gaps with, you know, the, like the podcast and other things. Cause like, it's just, it can't just be me or it can't just be what's like, your podcast called. It's called the after action podcast. It's on YouTube, Spotify and iTunes and, and iTunes. Yeah. Yeah. And How long have you had it? Just since November. It's so hard. Yeah. It's, it's so hard. It's yeah. <clears throat> I started a podcast. I don't, I mean, it's been a while, but, um, it was like a year before I ever even upload, just because I couldn't figure out how to actually upload it. <laughs> it's, <laughs> like, it's not that I wasn't, you know, yeah. recording them. I just didn't know how to upload them. And yeah. then finally one day it just clicked and Literally. Anyway, yeah, exactly. So, and then uh, you clicked onto Joe Rogan. Yeah. 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 That was cool. That was As fun. You were like such a good representation of like a guy wanting to be there for his community. Like that was the coolest thing. No, I appreciate it. I, I loved it. Yeah. It I, was cool to get it's to go. So, it's so cool to see like people like be in a, and just in a place where they really seize the moment. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I was like, dude, this is awesome. Like, yeah, he, uh, so I got to go on Cam Haynes, uh, 
podcast. You yeah. familiar with Cam Haynes? Yeah, Mr. Hammering. Yeah. yeah, keep hammering. Yeah, Mr. Hammering. He, yeah. Uh, him, and uh, Joe are pretty tight. Yeah, and uh, I, I don't know. It, it appears as though I would put Cam and Joe's top three friends. You know, that's just a guess. But yeah, anyhow, pretty tight. And so, boys. Yeah, uh, Cam reached out, got to go on his podcast, ran with him because you do the podcast. Um, I, I, I just don't. There's the the Keep Hammering Collective, which is the podcast, and then Lift, Run, Shoot. So when you go up there with Cam, you you uh, go on a run with him. You lift, and then you shoot a bow with him. And um, the run was, I mean, it, it'd be fine for you being a, you know. I don't think so. Former military, but like this dude. It's the furthest I've ever gone. We went 12 miles, and it's up this mountain. One of the miles, we're alternating carrying this rock. 75 pound rock i've seen this yes the, i saw you yeah. i saw you do yeah. there's clips of you yeah 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 yeah, yeah. the but, two clips stand out are you and huberman because huberman looks like he just got pulled out of a prison yard with all his tattoos yeah 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 which <laughs> you wouldn't expect being a, a, yeah. a professor at stanford yeah but um but it made me respect him even more yeah um so anyways we we go we, li- we do the lift run shoot and then i'm setting up my bow at um the bow rack with wayne and a famous bow guy up there in Oregon, Wayne Endicott. And we just, I just got done running further than I've ever ran in my life. Yeah. Not to mention it was on a mountain. Yeah. And part of it, I'm carrying a 75 pound rock. So, like, I'm glad that I did it, but like, I'm hurting. Mm-hmm. So, I go into the bathroom multiple times. It's coming out both ends. <laughs> and like, Cam is, it's almost like he didn't do anything. Yeah, he, he barely he, broke a sweat because he, pizza. he'll yeah. run 100 miles. And, um, anyways, Wayne's like, I think you need to check on him. Yeah. Anyhow. So like it was, it killed me. But then we got to do the podcast the next day. Cowboy Cerrone was actually coming the day after. So I, so I stayed an additional day and, um, stayed there and did the lift run shoot with, with Cowboy. Thankfully he had a, uh, hamstring injury. So I, we didn't have to go that hard. Yeah. Um, but that was a super cool event, super cool weekend. Cam was so intense. He would have been uh, good at anything he had done had yeah. it been anything other than elk hunting, which he's the best at. Regardless, um, I say all that to say that that weekend, uh, Joe started following me. Wow. And then that was in February of last year. Fast forward, Mountain Ops, um, a great supplement company that I work with, sent me on my first elk hunt, first bow hunt. Yeah. And, um, that was at, uh, Bear Mountain Outfitters, Brad po- Probst, good friend of mine, um, got me on a, a really good five by five. It was my first elk. Donnie was there. And, uh, and then I posted that picture. And then the next day, Joe DM'd me and said, Hey man, let's do a podcast. And, um, that's literally it. Yeah. I said, Hell yeah. Hell yeah. There were a lot of people in my industry that like, not a lot. There were two people in my industry, three maybe. Name I can them. think of two specifically. I want was it to. you? No, 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 no. Oh. <laughs> in my industry, that like we're like, hey, what marketing firm did you use to reach out to his team to get on? You know, they just couldn't believe. You yeah. Know? And I was like, well, he actually messaged me. You know. <laughs> wow. No, no it, but but you ever it was, think about how crazy that is? That everything in your life led you to that moment? That literally you like? I think about it every day. Isn't I'm fascinated with. Like if life stops right now, it was awesome. Yeah. Oh, for sure. It was awesome. Yeah. And I think that's the greatest gift some of us have who've chased a dream. Oh, for sure. Because that's ultimately what like all the people in my life that I'm really pulled towards is that I'm pulled, I pull towards people who've chased a dream because I don't think people realize that they haven't really chased a dream until you're there. You're like, oh, I'm, I'm living it. Yeah. I feel, I feel, man, if something happened that I this changed like I know that I have not taken this for granted you know there's been Same. times in my life whenever I was in a situation but most of like I'm usually pretty aware of I try to stay yeah. pretty aware of like this is a blessing and it could change and I just I'm thankful but I, it was a, a little over a year ago we went to R.A. Brown Ranch it's right down the road and Donnell Brown went around the I took all the interns there was like 10 of us there total and I was the last one he asked. And I don't know why I wasn't ready after he asked nine people yeah. where they wanted to be in five years. But he got to me and I was just like, oh, crap. And just 
from the bottom of my heart. I was like, to be honest, if I'm in this exact same space in five years, and I don't mean like I stay steady as a human, I don't want to grow, but if I am literally, if my day to day is the same in the, in five years as it is today, then I will be so grateful just because same. my life and my routine, the people I work with, the things I get to do, my job, you know, um, Something will probably be a little different. There'll be nuances, I'm sure. Instagram, yeah. TikTok, Snapchat, one of them won't be. There'll be a new one, whatever. All those things will be a little different. But essentially just you know, creating content where I can be an ambassador for, number one, my faith, number two, the rodeo industry, mm-hmm. and you know, hopefully the country. Yeah. But regardless. Um, I mean, that's all you can ask for, honestly. Like I said, it's crazy, the internet. I I don't, I don't, I, I always feel like, uh, I was talking to donut operator about this recently and like, we always say it's a, it's word vomit. Like if you just list what happened that day, it sounds crazy, Mm -hmm. Um, but it's really what happened. And so you, you end up trying to downplay it because it does come across as a little bit. You think they won't believe you? Yeah. Like, um, in December I was at a range day with donut operator, Brandon Herrera, Bill Goldberg yeah, and they, the Undertaker. Yeah, they asked me to go. You should have come. I was at. I was at. Well, I was at the NFR. It's our ten day Super Bowl. Yeah, like it's literally like if we played football, I was at the Super Bowl. Yeah, like I literally was messaging him. I was like, Dale Brzee's coming, and then he he was like, No, he can't. He's coming. But there's another one. We'll talk about the date offline. You're invited to it. But sweet. Um, and but it's I, a, I do I do follow all those guys. Oh yeah. Well, it's but like I shot machine guns next to the dead man. Yeah. Like, okay, that doesn't sound real, right. but it it happened. It like right. really, really happened. If Caleb Francis, you get to meet him. Yeah, he's Hi so guys. yeah. Oh, he's so. <laughs> Caleb's funny. one of my favorite people. I always say Caleb's so um naturally funny that he's robbing the rest of us who are working. Yeah, and be like, <laughs> and and then he's like, oh yeah, and by the way, he's scary strong. Oh yeah, he's yeah. gonna compete in like the yeah strongman. There's yeah, and he's like, it's all right, buddy, <laughs> and like. Yeah, he, like he just can like, pick up like several hundred pounds. It yeah, every day. And like I he he makes me laugh so much that like my stomach hurts whenever like we're around and I'm actually super excited about Shot Show just cuz I'm going to get to hang out with him when he's there. Yeah, me and Donnie met him at Yee Yee Day and it we geeked out. He's he's so funny. I saw another uh TikToker that I follow, uh Brooke. I, I'm try I, I I think it starts with the H her last name, Hallisper. What, she little does, bear. She does a lot of voiceovers, and I was at my booth in Fort Worth, and we're in the corner of this building. It's a tiny booth, and I've got my apparel there at the rodeo, Fort Worth yeah. Stock Show and Rodeo. This was like a week ago, and she just walked by, and I was like, do you do TikToks? And her face kind of turned red. She looked over, and uh, anyways, it was wild. That was another Caleb Francis moment I had, but yeah. seeing her there. but um, No, I mean, it's, it's, it's just like, and it's, it's not something to like brag about. It's just something where you're like, what an incredible journey this life is. Like, yeah. who who cares, like, if it ends tomorrow, like, how blessed we are to be able to, like, say that we all got to make a living, like, having fun. Yes. And that's what it's all about. Brooke Hargis. Brooke Hargis. Yeah. Shout out, Brooke Hargis. Have you seen her? Does she look familiar? I probably heard her. Let me look at that. Can I do this? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. she does voiceovers, and... Just her facial expressions. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know who this is. She's so freaking funny. Yeah. Dude, I geeked out, took a selfie, whatever. I love just, no, I get it. I love just watching uh, Caleb's videos. It's like my number Caleb. one thing to geek out about. Like him and Heather did one recently. Like, Had you been following him since we, back when he was in West Virginia? Um, Yeah, but like he, he had come on board with all the Black Rifle crew and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like... First time I saw him, I was like, you're Caleb Francis. He's like, hi, buddy. <laughs> and so, like, he's just a character. Yeah, so I we had, we had all been kind of following him since, like, he's just on the East Coast and being being Caleb, you being know. Being silly, drinking yeah, milk. And, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, with the towel on his head. And, uh, like, literally just a towel, flat paper towel. And, um, yeah, and then when I saw him, like, I didn't think I could be more of a fan. And then saw him with Black Rifle, and it was like, dear Lord, this is amazing. What a collaboration. Yeah. You know, and they were like, and they, and he's like, yeah, they just hired me to come down, just make videos, do, and I was like, of course they did. Yes. Why would they not? And he's so good at it. it it's a little, it's a little bothersome because you're like, yeah, I'll be like coming up with ideas forever. And he's like, uh, what if I just 
eat a chip the wrong way. <laughs> and he turns it over sideways and, and then it goes viral. Yeah. And I'm like, come on, man. Like, I'm trying. And yeah. it's it's not a slide against him. It is he like understands like everything about oh yeah him no, no, and no. his comedy. But it, then he gets into deeper stuff like you know God makes a centipede or whatever, and he's like yeah. you my my it's, child will have a hundred feet. Why I, I don't know. You'll just need <laughs> his his conversations with God. Yeah, are hilarious. Like yeah. the 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 one of the very first ones I shared. Like I I wish I could find it. I could go back. But like he uh, where he's having conversations and it's just like Jesus talking to one of the angels and they talk about Easter and yeah. they talk about the bunny. Yeah. It's like how absurd it all is. And he's just like looking back up. He's just like, yeah, he's I don't know. anyway. No, he, he does that. The videos he made. Did you see the ones he made with Marcus Latrell? Yes. Those are hilarious. He made one recently with Heather. That's really funny. Him and Heather do really good. Ones. Which one? Heather Lynn. It was I, I, like, no, I've seen the video. Yeah. It's a, uh, the trend. It's like, we're, we're whatever. Like I did like we're veterans, but it's like we're friends. And he's like, We're friends. I hired guys to follow her on the way home. And and like he's just doing all this weird stuff to her. She's like, We're friends. I'll pick you up at the airport. And he's like, We're friends. I'm gonna change all the clocks in her house. He like does all this crazy yeah. stuff. And she's like, Why are you doing this to me? I was so scared. And he's like, We're friends. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I just love the way he does it. His yeah. de- his delivery's so, so good. It's yeah. Oh. Yeah, he's supposed to, he's gonna come up here down here. Up here. Yeah, he's down in San Antonio. Yeah, they're all in San Antonio. He's going to come up here at some point but um, and be on the podcast. No, you, you, I mean, it'll, it'll hurt how, how funny he is. That's hilarious. Where do you, what are you go? where are you going next? Where am I going next? Yeah. Uh, Shot shows uh, on the horizon. That's, that's a big thing. Um, are y'all going to that? Are y'all going to Shot Show? No, I've always thought about possibly, but I, yeah, as of right now, I'm not going. It's it's a it's a lot. I mean, it's it's like drinking water through a, a fire hose, you know. Um, and so being there with that, we're doing some things there. Uh, I've got a few other things to do it. I mean, my my main focus right now is really just like continuing to do like veteran with the sign in the sense of like. I always say that like that ev- anything that goes towards like supporting that is what keeps the lights on. Does that make sense? Because mm-hmm. like yeah, of course. My goal ultimately is to make like jokes or stories or little silly things. Like yesterday was me outside my wife's idea. All of her ideas are the best. I love you, Christy. But it was her idea to be like do a cold weather one because it's snowing in Nashville and it's just me being like don't put your hands in your pockets. Yeah. And so that's the type of stuff that'll eventually lead you to the point where I'm like, Hey, go get the help you need. Right. Or to remind you about a veterans organization that's doing stuff to help people yeah, or, for sure. or like whatever it is. And so, but I've, I just felt limited with it. And so that's when I shifted to the podcast is like, yeah, of course. this is the larger thing, which I would love to have you come up to Nashville on. And you love. can, Oh me. Yeah, dude. Yeah, for sure. Um, like, cause I'm convinced that, um, the post nine eleven veterans have this opportunity to be the next greatest generation, um, and I'm I'm super jazzed up on World War Two right now. I just saw the museum in New Orleans, and like, dude, it was crazy seeing yeah. a flying fortress and stuff. I'm I'm all in right now. But well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, no. It's just that we have this opportunity to be like this driving force for change and use our experiences that we've gained from war to help to lead change um, socially. Um, with like the way we view mental health, the way we view community and the way we view like friendship and brotherhood, like in the sense of like, we're not the only ones having like mental health issues, mm-hmm. but there's a large amount of support and focus on it. So I want to be a, a disruptor in the sense of like, we could all talk about this. You should yeah. talk about when you're feeling sad. You should talk about when you feel a certain way. Cause we need to just break the system as it is because it hasn't been working and we need to do something different. Yeah. Does that make sense? For sure. You know, cause like That's everyone cool has their you're... moment. But we have to push through it. Yeah, it's cool that you're passionate about because it's so easy, you know, just like, hey, I've, I've served my time. I've done my job. I'm on to the next one. You know, that's cool that you can, that you're passionate about staying involved. And I think, you know, you guys need that. You know, and there's, I can see people in the rodeo industry that do it, you know, not quite, again, not trying to, it's not quite no, as no. noble you know, but it's just like, hey, you know, like people staying involved past their uh, past their tenure, you know. But well, well it's it, I say it's my final mission beyond the battlefield. Yeah. Right. And so, like, I did this thing. Now, I just I what I really want is to create a community that's 
the place that I could have turned to when I didn't know how to get a GI bill, when I didn't know jobs mm-hmm. I could do, when I didn't know how to get my veteran benefits or any of those things. There was yeah. no one there. There right. was no one or nothing, even to the way there is now. So now I just kind of try and put all the information out there and to like create a fun place people can laugh, be nostalgic, reconnect with friends, send posts to each other. That's the whole idea is that people can send the content and be like, hey, what's up, Steve? I remember you were so dumb you did this, stuff like that. For sure. And then just be like, oh, yeah, I remember. Let's hang out yeah. with Steve. Make a, I'm forcing interaction. Well, you, 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 can, you, relate, you can relate to those guys. Yeah. I really, I followed, golly, it's King something. Uh but he he makes a lot of posts with a with a uh, with a page called Tier Three. Okay. Anyways, and it's no they they like take like you know it's almost like they're proud of being Tier Three. Yeah. And that's like essentially like they're wearing it on their as if they were you know. King picks media. That's it. Yeah, him. King picks so media. Funny. It's uh, Wins Chow and um, yeah, Win is Chow. Wins Chow. So it's King picks media, uh, Nora and Craig. They're the funniest. You should talk to him. You would love yeah. him. He's, um, he's hilarious. He, uh, he, so he, the things he does, like when he's a gun instructor, it's cause he used to be an instructor, like on a yeah, course. Yeah. You can tell he actually yeah. knows. Yeah. Right? yeah. That's yeah. what's I so mean, funny. The first two seconds you're like, all right, he actually knows. Now this is hilarious. Let's yeah. keep watching. Yeah. And he'll just be like, uh, Hey, your leg's been shot. And he just like throws a tourniquet off screen. What are you going to do? And people are like, mm, I guess you didn't make it. That's why you got to drill drills and practice. Like he just says the For craziest sure. stuff, and I'm like, oh, it's so good. The the Ranger imitation logo wins <laughs> Chow with, <laughs> yeah. the, with the. That's hilarious. Yeah. But no, the uh, is tier three his? Um, or is that just something he collabs I with? I think it's something he collabs with. Yeah. Uh, but wins Chow is his, and like he does all sorts of stuff. I talked to him. He's that's what's been so cool meeting people like that who like really like comedy and stuff. Like, For sure. Like, and he did this whole series where he, like, because he's he has a full-time job and a family, too. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like, he'll make content the way I do, which is in batches. It's probably the way you do it. Like, I make it, and then, like, it'll be a big gap, and then I'll make it again just because of time. Yeah, we try we try not to have gaps. Yeah. But, like, for instance, in December, it always happens because yeah. we're 10 days. We're two weeks in the at the NFR in Vegas. Yeah. We don't get to film a lot. And then everybody's, we're back a week, and then we go to Christmas. Yeah. And then we've got this ski trip. So anyways, it's like, yeah, it's like five weeks from January, from December to January. But we build up and it's crazy. Like this has happened the last few years. Like our December after November will be like our biggest YouTube payout ever. And then it just falls off. Yeah. Because we're all gone. And there's some days where I just, I just, I really consider doing nothing but staying at home. Because that's when we're actually doing as a quote unquote influencer, I guess I've learned that like there's, there's busy work and I guess there's busy work and there's income producing work. Yes. And the income producing work is creating, documenting content. Yeah. And it happens to be the part that I'm most passionate about. You know, the busy work would be like going to a booth with my apparel line or making an appearance and that feels like real work, but to be honest, it takes time away from the stuff that grows the brand. Yeah. And that's, and so I consider that busy work. Yeah. You might be reaping a harvest and, but to be honest, like if, if a brand were to call and say, Hey, we want you to fly here to do this thing. And I put this absurd number on it. It's for a couple of reasons. Number one, you're taking me away from me building my brand. Number two, I love my schedule. I woke up this morning, I worked out, I get to spend time with all, you know, my crew. Yeah. We made content. I go back to the house, I eat dinner, I go to bed early. Yeah. And so it costs you money. I I don't, especially once you realize you stop looking through the lens of money at success. I couldn't agree more with anything you're saying right now. You know what I mean? Like my, mine's just, all time. It used to be money. Well, of course you, you understand that you turned down a $30,000 gig to go work a night shift at a dang hospital. Yeah. Which is really dumb at the time. Like, legitimately, I had a really good and career. I shouldn't have said no to it. You're going from yeah. jumping out of helicopters, getting mm-hmm. shot at, and shooting people, to working as a receptionist on a graveyard shift. Yeah. Like, it, just the adrenaline change alone it was, was probably insanity. It was jarring. It was jarring. And then I remember, it's funny you say this, I remember being like, is this what I'm going to do for the rest of my life? Like, that was a mm-hmm. real thought. Like, I used to have a grenade launcher. <laughs> like, now I'm here. Yeah. yeah. Um. 
not trying to wrap this up, but when we do no, go wrap ahead. up, yeah. when we do wrap no, up, fine. We there's a couple of things I'm going to add one. We always ask like life advice. Yeah. Like what what is something that's been like your your go-to line of just this is something that's stuck with me. Like for something like for instance earlier when I said do the right thing for the right reasons and live with the consequences. I really like that. I'm going to steal that and rebrand it. You can use it. No. No. Um I stole it. It's yours. We're going to say it's yours time now. Um Really good life advice. I used to, I think it was James Dean that said this, and I think about it a lot more lately. It's a dream as if you'll live forever, live as if you'll die today. I, I think it was him that said that. Um, I really I really have that thought a lot. Like I'm always making plans for the future, you know, yeah. six months, a year, five years, things like that. But I've really, really been trying to work on like I'm here. I need to be present wherever my feet are is where I need to be especially with my phone in a sense of like, I can open up my phone. So can you, and you can make money doing it. Not mm-hmm. many people can do that. And that can become addicting. I've noticed um, yeah. it can really, you get pulled into this and then you're not in the moment. So like when I'm with my family, I'm trying to be more present than ever. Like that's my biggest, biggest thing. And I, I think everyone should embrace that more because for so long, I'm, my focus was if I get this job, if I get this money, I'll get these things to live the life I want to live. But when I change that to like, making my focus of my main goal of just spending time with my family the most. Then I got the money. Then I got the things that I wanted just by changing that. Like Mm -hmm. this is what I would need to focus on. And so everything's kind of centered around that now. Like that's good. Now, what are your, I got to write these down. So I'm going to get my phone out. Okay. What are your top five favorite movies? Top five favorite movies of any genre. Yep. Or even a show. The Office might be one of the the greatest television shows of all time, like literally one of the greatest television shows of all time. Uh, yep. Followed closely by Parks and Recs, which is one of the greatest mm-hmm. um, satirical critiques of government and how it works and the things associated with it. Yep, I got Parks and Rec. Um, top movie. See, I'm thinking of a movie I could watch any time mm-hmm. ever. Yeah. I don't count this as one movie, but the Lord of the Rings trilogies. I could watch okay. at any given moment. Okay. Like, I could sit down and be like, like, if you were to turn on right here, I would melt for six hours. Okay. Actually, nine hours, because I watched the extended editions. All right. What about a war movie? A war movie? war movie? A war movie. Oh. It's not a movie, but it's a series. It's the Pacific. Cause it's literally about the Marines. But what I love about that one in particular is they highlight multiple Marine stories. Eugene Sledge, who wrote a very good book. Um, Lecky, I can't remember his name, who wrote a good book as well. Um, John Bass, it talks about John Bassalone, the famous machine gunner who got the medal of honor. Do you know who that story about him? No. Real quickly. John Bassalone was a army veteran was uh, in a war. I think it was in the Philippines. Um, uh, but yeah, I believe it was Guadalcanal. So he was a machine gunner leading, um, they were being assaulted by the Japanese. And at that time, machine guns were water cooled and the water evaporated in the machine gun. And he was up for 24 hours straight and just shooting the enemy as they came. And they kept coming on like wave on wave on wave. And people described it as never ending. And at one point he stood up to actually pee on his gun to cool it down just to keep firing at the enemy. But then the bodies stacked so high, he couldn't actually see his fields of fire. So he ran out in the, under the cover of night while they were still taking fire, pushed the bodies down the other side of the hill just so he could see more enemy. Dang. And he got the Medal of Honor for it. What is the story? I think I read it in... So Marcus has two books. Yes. He's got Lone Survivor, and the second one is Service. Yes. and That's it, the one he wrote with Dakota, right? Is it no. Um, Robert O'Neill wrote one with Dakota. That's Martin. what it is. Yeah, sorry. And that Robert Dakota's first book was End of the Fire. Yes. And then the 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 one that he did with Rob O'Neill, what was that one called? Something about forward, for, front. Probably. Front was, towards enemy or something like something that. Something like that. Yeah, but, that's a Claymore. Right. Anyways, yeah. uh, Marcus's second book is called Service. And yeah. he, he, in it, he tells a lot of stories of some other guys. Uh-huh. And I think it's in that book where he talks about two Marines. There was a car coming into a base. and Corporal uh, Jason Dunham. Suicide you know, like the, the, it was a, you know, suicide bomber. Yeah. And these two Marines are shooting at this car 
and ultimately they end up dying. Mm-hmm. But the 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 part of the story is that they actually they knew that obviously going into it as they're shooting, mm-hmm. but they don't. They, there's no backup in them. Yeah. They they continued moving forward as this car is coming out. Is that do you are you familiar with that story? I'm familiar with that story. I thought it was Jason Dunham's story, the Marine who dived on a grenade, I believe it was, and he got a Medal of Honor as well. And ship's named after him, I believe. Uh post uh humously, I think is how you say it. Yeah. Uh posthumously, actually. I can't remember. Yeah. But um no, but I know what you're talking about. There were two Marines in Iraq at a vehicle control uh, Iraq. A vehicle checkpoint. Um, and so they're, they're set up in what's called a serpentine, right? It's a snake method. So the idea is that you, it's, it's impossible to exceed certain speeds mm-hmm. going that way. And they had a uh, wire and stuff. And so this vehicle was a suicide, um, a vehicle born IED, uh, said, and they were, there's a suicide bomber in there. And so they're driving as fast as they can. And the, what you're supposed to do is try and disable the engine first and just put as many rounds in the engine and then work up to the windshield and then just lay down fire and so they're at this checkpoint and uh they as i as i remember it they do keep moving towards it like as it yeah. starts to finally get to the place where they would check ids and stuff and they still just keep going it until the vehicle i believe it got basically disabled and so that's why the bomb went off he, he triggered it because he couldn't go any further and didn't it didn't it, and it detonate yeah and it took their lives yes i yeah. believe so i believe that's the story yeah dang yeah and that's the type of stuff people don't really realize is that that's what's happening. Um, and, you know, um, that's... Uh, the fact that they didn't move back at all yeah. is what... But they could have. They actually could have. Right. They, they literally could have because past them, they could just get onto the base, but they, they didn't... They knew that, yeah, they yeah. knew that they were the last line of defense yeah. for the... Otherwise, it would have... I mean, it would have been more than two. Yeah, it could have been... They could have got to the the chow hall to any one of the buildings or like wherever people are. I mean, those people, when they do those things, they have knowledge of, of what's going on. They understand uh, yeah. where, where they need to go. And so like driving through a, a way where they knew they would get searched fast enough just to try and get past them. They had knowledge of what was happening. That's so, wild. Yeah. That's wild that it could have been just like a random Tuesday. And yeah. They were called to do that. Yeah. I mean, it's, Things that are extraordinary become ordinary after a certain amount of time. We're doing that type of work, and you know, uh, and I think uh, it's not that it's not valued enough. It's not really understood the reality of the situation that happens, mm-hmm. and that's why um, you know when I look back on my military career, I'm I'm just blessed in so many different things. But like, I saw the worst of people, but I I saw the best of them at the same time, mm-hmm. and like that's that's something I'll never forget. Yeah, I can yep. only imagine. Yeah, people pushing each other out of the way for stuff you know, putting their lives on the lines for others, you know, with reckless abandon in a, in a way that can only be described as true love. I mean, that's, yeah, it's one of the most incredible things I've ever been a witness to. Well, thanks for your service. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Thanks for coming on the rodeo time podcast. Um, I'm a big fan of, you know, anything former military present future military. Like, like I said, I've read all a bunch of the books and so, um, it is the Rodeo Time podcast, but I don't know. We've we've had a lot of guests that are Marines, SEALs, Army, whatever it is, yeah. just because I'm such a fan. And uh, I think my demographic is, you know, yeah. there's nobody, there's there's almost probably nobody more patriotic than rodeo fans just because we are, we get to experience the epitome of freedom. We rodeo where we want, with who we want, when we want, you go here and Every time they play that national anthem right before the bareback ride and everybody gets chills just because we just, we love it and um, we're very appreciative. And so, I don't know, I guess that's maybe what causes me to reach out to guys like yourself, you know. But, I'm I'm honored and privileged. I mean, I can't thank you enough. It's incredible. Well, where can we find you? Veteran um, with the sign on Instagram. Veteran with the sign on Instagram. It's there on TikTok and, and also on Facebook and on YouTube. And the podcast is up there as the After Action Podcast. Sweet. Yeah. Well, cool deal. You guys check him out. Check out that podcast, rodeotime.com for all your apparel needs. Thank you to Rock and Roll Denim, American Hats, Mountain Op Supplements, Total Feeds, and Can-Am Side-by-Sides. Those are my personal sponsors and uh, who I get to work with every day that allow me to do this podcast. So thank you guys. Pow, pow, and on to the next one.